Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Sadaret hosted Chesapeake and EdgeTech webinar. We're lucky to have a number of attendees from various time zones. So thank you for attending today. I appreciate some of you will be up very early uh, for this one. So this morning, we have Harold from Chesapeake and we have Nick Lawrence from EdgeTech who will be uh, running through the presentations. And then this afternoon, uh, we have um, Richard Hill from EdgeTech and Harold again. Um, and we're going to split it into two sections. So after the quick introduction, um, Nick will run through the um, EdgeTech products and features with a focus on side scan and sub bottom. And um, once he's done that, Harold will then take over and run through the CernaWiz side scan processing and we'll work through a data set from an EdgeTech 4125. And after which he will then run through and do some sub bottom processing and again focus on the new reflector tracking and data processing. And we will then stop around about 12.30 for short lunch break. Uh, during this time, um, we will have the question box will be open and we will be answering any questions we have during that time. But feel free to answer questions or ask questions at any time. Um, we'll all be monitoring and we will be answering the questions um, as we go through. After lunch, we have um, Richard will take over and he will do a presentation on the EdgeTech Bathy products and new developments. And as you can see, the rough times that we've got for these. And then Harold will follow running through some Bathy processing. So we've tried to keep everything linked as we go through. We shall have a short coffee break around about 1500. And then after the coffee break, Harold will then run through some export functions in SonarWiz. And then the guys will do a quick presentation on plans for 2021 and beyond. And to give you an idea of what new products will be coming out. And we will then do a quick presentation on Sadaret, so you know who we are and where we are and what we do. So um, one thing to say, the webinar will be recorded and it will be posted after the workshop. So I think, um, I think that's all good to go. And as I said, if under the GoToWebinar control panel, if you have any questions, please enter into there and um, we'll be able to get back to you. I think I'll hand this over to Nick now. And thanks again for joining and enjoy the day. So Nick, uh, you have presenter rights. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Um, are you seeing any of my? Are you seeing the screen yet, or am I? Uh... Blue screen. You on your right monitor. Um, there it is. That's a good. That's good. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Sorry for the um, for the delay, everybody. While I um, sort out my uh, my technology. It's, uh, and thank you very much for um, for listening in or logging in to um, 
to the seminar. So my name's Nick Lawrence. I'm one of the business development directors for EdgeTech, and I'm going to give a presentation on some of our sonar systems, primarily uh, side scan, sub bottom, and a little bit about some of the uh, some of the combined systems. So a quick introduction to EdgeTech. And I, hope, I hope most of you know of us. Um, EdgeTech, formerly e and g Marine Instruments, was founded in 1966 by Doc Edgerton. We um, merged with ORE in, uh, that was formed in 1963, but we merged with ORE in about the mid 1990s. And we have facilities in um, both Massachusetts and Florida. Um, basically, we're probably best known for side scan sonars and sub bottom profilers, also do bathymetric systems, uh, acoustic releases, and USBL systems. Essentially, anything that's um, underwater acoustics. So, a little bit more on uh, the type of products we do um, and we, the fact that we also get involved in doing AUV and ROV systems. It's not just towed systems and pole mounted systems, but it's a, it's a range of products across a different um, different host vehicles. Um, I'm going to run through a couple of slides that just show you uh, some of our standard products. I'm not going to go through the detail that's on the slides at this point because really it's just to show the fact that you know the sort of range of products we do. I'm going to talk about some of these products in a bit more de detail as I go through the presentation. Um, and just uh, it's just really to give you an outline of the sort of things that uh, we've been doing, some of the products that we've introduced, and where where we're we're sort of going with some of the uh, some of the products we've developed. So this just shows the standard towed side scans, the 4125 and the 4205, um, the bathymetry and side scan system that Richard's going to talk about this afternoon, the 6205S and our sort of newest sub bottom profile of the 3400 which is just going to be a which is a toad or pole mount um, sub bottom profiler system we do combined systems so these are combined side scan and sub bottom or in the case of some of the systems combined side scan bathymetry and sub bottom and we do these again in a range of platforms so toad um, ROV, AUV, USVs more more recently, and um, also we still we still build the occasional deep toe system. Less deep toe systems uh, than we used to build, primarily because most people are using AUVs for these uh, deep water applications now. But uh, we do still build a few. So really, just to um, just to get started uh, on. On start with side scan sonar systems. Um, the main thing, and I, and I hope I'm not going to be um, sort of preaching to the choir too much in the sense that uh, it's telling you stuff you know, but uh, I'm going to start with some of the basic stuff, which is that um, when you're looking at side scan, as with any acoustic system, you're looking at a balance between uh, range and resolution in this case, um, between range and some sort of performance. Um, the accuracy or, or penetration for sub bottom profilers, um, resolution for side scan. So at low frequencies, we get nice long range. Um, we've even done systems down to 75 kilohertz, which will get you basically almost a thousand meters either side of the towfish. Um, but they are very low resolution. And at the other end of the spectrum, uh, you have this lovely image at the bottom right of the three that are, uh, sorry, the four that are in that image, 1600 kilohertz, really, really high resolution data. You can see, you know, lots of detail on the on on the plane image. Um, but that system will give you about 30, 20 to 35 meters range, 35 meters on a very good day, um, either side of the towfish. So very high resolution, but very short range. So we're um, perpetually playing the trade-off between range and resolution. Um, and so that's something to bear in mind always when thinking about side scan or indeed any, uh, any acoustic system. So it sort of brings us into discussion about how, how do you define range uh, with a side scan sonar? 
Um, is it the fact that you can see an e echo from a target? Um, well, I'd argue it needs to be a little bit more than that. Um, we can stick a wreck out at far range and a nice strong return off a, off a off signal off it, and yeah, you'll see it at very long range. Um, but you know, is that really useful? A useful piece of data? It's all right if you're just trying to do a, 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 a search and find the target, and you're going to go and do a more detailed inspection of it afterwards. But if this is your general mapping capability, then you probably want uh, a little bit more information. So you probably want to be able to see shadows behind the target so you can help identify it. Um, either way, whether you're just saying, I want to see shadow behind the target, as you can in this, this image out of the far range, it's, it's a matter of signal and noise ratio. So we, what are the factors we can control when, um, when setting uh, range? We can use chirp technologies which is what we do do that gives us a better signal to noise ratio so we can get uh, we can get longer range chirp can also be known as broadband or spread spectrum technologies you see it across different products and different acoustic products called different things essentially they're all using the same sort of technique um, so you, you you see when we're talking about chirp side scan and you see a product in another acoustic field talking about a broadband system they're, they're, they're fundamentally using the same sort of technologies. Um, the other factors we can control, we can go for a very low uh, noise floor electronics. We can get very low signal levels, and that allows us, again, to get a very big dynamic range and very good signal to noise ratio so that we can, um, we can track to far ranges. So the things we can't control are the environmental factors. Um, and Again, this is something that can have a significant impact on uh, side scan range performance. Again, other acoustic systems are the same. Um, at side scan frequencies, uh, absorption is the main uh, thing we need to worry about, um, which in turn depends on frequency, temperature, and salinity. So the plot on the right shows uh, just shows some, some fairly basic plots for, for, for fresh water. Um, what you might see in somewhere like the Baltic that, that, that that's, um, has fairly low salinity, although it has other issues related to thermoclines. Um, but, uh, and then sort of North Sea, which I always sort of think of as a, about the worst case you generally get. And, but if you notice the absorption coefficient here as we go up in frequency, this is a logarithmic scale. So, you know, down at sub bottom frequencies, we can be talking less than a dB a kilometer. When we start getting up at the higher side scan frequencies, we can be talking um, easily uh, 100 dB a kilometer. So, so it's hugely, hugely different. Um, what does that mean in real world terms? Well, again, the graph on the left shows um, a sort of typical range modeled uh, at some different frequencies, 120 up to 850 kilohertz. And it's showing what uh, what sort of range you could expect. Um, it's just parts per it's parts per milliliter, so parts per thousand, um, uh, in a sort of fairly freshwater, or almost freshwater environment. Um, if I do the same plot and put it in what I would call my North Sea environment, you can see that very quickly, even the scale changes. Now at 120 kilohertz, instead of getting over 500 meters range, I'm down. 250 to 350 meters range, um, and and so you know it has a very significant impact on the performance of that you're going to get out of your side scan. So understanding the environments you're going to be operating in um, can have a you know can be very beneficial to, in terms of understanding what you're likely to get in terms of range performance. Uh, it gets even more interesting if you talk talking about areas that have got sediment um, high sediment concentrations in the water. Um, and then that is particularly at higher frequencies. Um, one of the interesting things is that at lower frequencies, um, typically the predicted ranges increase at lower temperature. So here's 120, around 200 kilohertz, 270, um, even getting up to about um, 410 kilohertz. Um, and for me, historically, you know, I've, I've always taken the view, yeah, yeah, low, low temperature is great for your side scan, gives you a nice uh, long range. Of course, as we've built higher and higher frequency systems, we've discovered, of course, this changes. 
um, at higher frequencies actually you start to lose range at, uh, at low temperature. So my, um, if I start getting up to my um, 1600 kilohertz system, it really doesn't like low temperature. So it's a shallow water, great in shallow water, but uh, not a deep water solution. Um, and uh, along with some other information, this, um, this, there's some notes on this uh, on our website in the, in the resource section. There's also some notes on things like feature detection and stuff like that. So again, if you're interested in, in, in looking at some of the thing aspects of side scan performance, um, that, that's all there. So that, that's really just running through some sort of general stuff about um, side scan generally. Uh, to talk about some specific models, uh, 4125 is our shallow water side scan. Uh, it was really developed for the uh, search and rescue, search and recovery market, um, and for shallow water survey generally. It's chirp, it's designed to be portable, uh, and it runs on a coax cable. So in theory, you can uh, you can run it relatively um, relatively deep. It's 200 meter depth rated. Um, however, to get it to that 200 meter depth rating, you'd need to run it on about 600 meters of um, 11 mil steel armored tow cable. And the question at that point, I have to be honest, the question I, I always ask at that point is, do you really want to be operating a 4125 at that point, or should you be looking at a larger, deeper, deeper tow fish? Um, so really, I would focus this at um, 100 meters water depth or less. And we do uh, two tow fish versions of 400 and 900 kilohertz. Uh, the 400, so there you get about 150 meter range out of it and the 600 and 1600 kilohertz 600 kilohertz you get about 120 meters range um probably about 100 meters in the north sea and 1600 kilohertz 35 meter range so uh, as i said that's on a good day uh, depending on the environment you in, might you're in that might be as low as 20 to 25 meters uh, so we just say we can do various cable options so you can actually achieve um, up to the 200 meter water depth, but say really 100 meters or, or less, I would think is the, I, I view this as the, the optimum product for. It does give you some nice data. This is some uh, 900 kilohertz data, bottom of a, of a harbor area. That's actually a pretty large tire the, on the left hand side of the screen. And the right hand side is the sort of vehicle that it came from. Um, this, is, uh, this is sitting on the, the, the bottom of a, a harbor. Getting back to our 1600 kilohertz and talking about how, how, how high resolution is, this is a really nice uh, image of a, of a wreck that's sitting off the coast of Massachusetts and we use quite regularly when we're, um, we're, we're trying to sort of get a good idea of the relative performance of different uh, systems. And you can see that when you start zooming in on the data, you can see an awful lot of detail into this, um, into, into this, into the wreck. Uh, the middle of the three images, you can actually see where the uh, that zoomed in on a section of the hull where there were some portholes, uh, and you, the, you can actually see the side scan illuminating through the portholes and giving you those those circles in the in the in the shadow area. Um, from recollection, those circles are those portholes because I talked to somebody who's actually dived on the wreck. Those portholes are about. Um, I'm going to say about 20 to 30 centimeters in diameter, somewhere in that sort of area, um, probably about 25 centimeters. So it gives you a good idea of the sort of um, the sort of image resolution you, you can pull out when you start zooming into the data. Uh, and lastly, for the 4125, um, this is some um, uh, habitat mapping data. So this is showing some seagrass and milfoil. Uh, that was again acquired at um, 850 uh, kilohertz, 900 kilohertz, um, and it's um, and it shows again that the sort of um, the sort of detail you can pull out of the data sets um, and how the system can be used for things like habitat mapping. Um, so again, it's a nice uh, a nice data example. So that's pretty much the uh, 4125. The next uh, system up, and the one that I actually think of as, as, as the workhorse of the, uh, uh, the, the side scan sonar systems we produce, is the 4205. 
uh, the replacement for the 4200, which has been around, which was around for about 15 years and had become, um, again, effectively the standard, the work as for a lot of survey applications. Uh, the 4205 gives um, some improved range performance, um, improved resolution in, in, uh, in some of the configurations, um, a little bit more power to run external sensors such as magnetometers, and um, we've tried as much as possible to get backward compatibility with some of the 4200 top sides, although that tends to be the more recent ones uh, that we can do upgrades for older ones if you, if you have older top sides. But the point was to try and do something that uh, allowed you to just replace your 4200 rather than have to replace the whole system. A couple of top side options. The, uh, we do a 19 inch rack mount um, top side, which uh, again can be used either uh, with a customer supplied PC or we can, uh, we can provide a laptop or even a, a full rack mount PC to go with that. Um, the 701 is the same top side largely that, that, that was used with the 4200. Uh, the only issue there is you're limiting yourself really to providing a, an amp output to external sensors from the towfish. So fine if you're running a signal, a single magnetometer, but if you want to start running um, a couple of magnetometers as a gradiometer, particularly the, the things like the Geometrics G882, then you need more power, and you need to look at the Starmux 4 top side on the right-hand side, which is a higher power unit. Again, we can provide that just as a rack mount unit, or um, we can supply it with a, a PC, as in this case, where we've included a, a PC in the rack mount case. And then we can provide um, three amps to external sensors off the back of the towfish. So in terms of the towfish themselves, uh, we do two distinct types of towfish for the 4205. We do the 4205 tri-frequency. Um, so this allows you to operate any two frequencies at the same time. The idea of having the three frequencies is that you basically can use the same towfish for a, a wider range of tasks. So if you're doing a task where you want to do a wide area search, you can use the lower frequencies. If you're using something where you're trying to do classification of a, of a target, then you can use the higher frequencies and you can pick the best two for the application that you're working on. It's on the fly reconfiguration through the software. You don't even need to bring it back up on deck to change it. You can just through the software control, turn off one frequency and turn on another. That simple. Um, the other version we do is the dual frequency multipulse motion tolerant version. So here you have two frequencies, and in this towfish you can operate it in two modes: a high definition mode or a multipulse motion tolerant mode. The multipulse mode, as its name suggests, means you get multiple pulses in the water column, and you can run at higher speed for the same number of uh, long track ping rate. Um, and it also gives you the benefit of a motion tolerant mode, which I'll talk about a little bit more shortly. Um, these ones, we started off doing uh, free frequency sets, uh, 12410, so 100, 400 historical parlance, uh, 23540, 23850. Um, and more recently, we've introduced, uh, or we are introducing a 540 and 850 kilohertz unit so what would historically have been called 600 and 900. And the idea of this is to is because we have some, um, some customers working in the renewable sector with wind farms where they're getting asked to look at that, uh, that frequency combination. So um, we actually uh, went and developed one uh, to meet that specific requirement. I mentioned that we get better range performance out of the, 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 the 4205 compared with the 4200. Um, the, right, the plots on the right give you an idea of the sort of increases we're, that we're, we're looking at. The 850, we're struggling a little bit to get more, much more range out of it than, uh, than we got out of a 4200. That's as much to do with the geometry and, and, and everything else um, when we're flying at that seabed height and looking for those ranges as to do with the uh, noise floor of the system. But for all the other all the other frequencies, we, we, the, the lower noise floor of the system is allowing us to get longer range. Um, and this is just a data example. This is actually 200 meters range at 410 kilohertz. So it's showing that you know we are actually getting good range with shadows out at that sort of range using using these frequencies. 
this was done off the east coast of the US, so um, not the worst environment, but certainly not the best either. It, it, so it, it's a realistic of, of what can be achieved with the system. So in terms of multi-pulse and uh, mode and feature detection, um, IHO and NOAA both use the, the, the number of pings on a target as, as a way of defining feature detection. Um, those of you who've, who've ever heard me speak before will know I've spent a long time talking to people about the difference between uh, feature detection and resolution, because there's often confusion about that. Uh, and here I'm going to concentrate on what the uh, say what the, the the published guidance on feature detection typically says, and it typically says you need to get three pings on a on, on a target. Say it varies slightly, but it, it's it's normally around that sort of uh, variation. Uh, and if you look at the IHO manual, it uh, it works out a calculation that tells you that for uh, 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 to receive n pings on on a target of l, l meters, that, that you know here's the formula for how you work it out. So it's basically the ship speed. How, how long between pings in time, um, and there's a factor for the uh, for the for the, the beam width of the system. And here's the interesting thing: is when you're looking at feature detection and, and pings on the target, a wider beam width actually helps. Um, now, the reality is that that's fine in the sense that yeah, you want a wide beam width to help with your feature detection, but then it's going to make your data not look as nice. It's not going to be as high resolution. Therefore, there is a trade-off to be made between selecting the you know, finding a beam width that gives good feature detection and still gives you nice data. Um, accounting for the fact that it may be a multiple system, we changed the, um, uh, the formula slightly, and we um, we put in a, a value p for the number of pulses in the water column that the system can handle at any time. So uh, we can take that formula and rearrange it and try and work out a maximum speed in which we can achieve uh, a number of pings on the target. And if I take three pings on a one meter target, which is the historical IHO, no numbers, although I, I understand in a lot of um, application these days, people are looking for three pings on a much smaller target than one meter, but uh, you know you can just adjust the formula accordingly. Um, but for three pings on a one meter target, you can see that uh, when we have a single pulse system, then, then typically we're looking at uh, something like 3.2 knots. Um, what you'll notice in this formula is that I've totally removed the beam width factor. Um, and the reason I've ignored the beam width is because if you introduce the beam width, it then becomes that beam width varies with how far you are out in the range. So the formula then becomes specific to where you are in the record, how far out from the towfish you are. And that's not really very useful to people. You want to know that you've got these three pings on a target anywhere in the range that you the record you're looking at so i've removed the beam width factor um there's some slightly neater ways of um, accommodating that that beam width factor but for the moment i've i've gone for the very um the very simplified approach of uh, of just removing it so we've taken the beam width factor out we do the calculation and we find that for three pings on a one meter target we can run at 3.2 knots on 150 meter range if we stick the towfish in multi-pulse mode, so we now have two pulses in the water column, we can um, we can double the speed at which we can achieve that, or we can get twice as many pings on the target at the original speed. So it's it's essentially giving you more a, a greater detection capability. There is some trade-off in beam width, but uh, that's uh, that's a trade-off I generally think is worth making in terms of detection. So what's the motion tolerant part of it? Because I mentioned that it, you, you get multi-pulse and motion tolerance. Well, one of the things if you've operated side scans much that you may well have seen is this sort of banding that you see in the image on the right. Um, this is due to your and pitch induced artifacts. And basically it's because the receive beam and the transmit beam are no longer entirely co-located. The topish has moved slightly either in pitch and your during the, during the period that you're transmitting and between transmit and receive. Um, if you look at it, it's not actually how far you move in pitch and your that matters, it's the rate of change of pitch and your, which is why you tend to see it in marginal weather where the towfish is moving around 
quickly. Um, if it's just a slow variation in pitch and yaw, doesn't matter in terms of this banding. Um, but if you get rapid changes because of weather, then you will tend to see it. And that motion is a is a is transmitted from the towfish to, um, from the vessel down the cable, um, and it's a damped wave. So the shorter the cable, the more pronounced it is. So you tend to see this effect in shallow water um, and, uh, and and rougher weather. Okay. So what are your options? You could try putting the thing on an AUV. You can try software solutions. We've done some of that in the past. In this case, we've done an alternative hardware solution. So we uh, basically use a wider receive beam and a narrow transmit beam. And by varying those two, we can accommodate a much bigger um, rate of change of yaw. So we increase the two-way beam width by about 25 to 30%. So again, slight increase in beam width but we can cope with about a 300% increase in the yaw rate. So a lot with a lot less, worse weather. Um, what does that make the data do? Well, here's an example where it's taken out the banding. That's the standard mode at the top, the motion tolerant mode at the bottom. It's actually taken off a 6205 system where you can display both. And here's a data set where it's been switched from a, a standard mode to a, a motion tolerant mode. Um, as you go down the line, and you can see that the data in the motion tolerant mode is much cleaner, much easier to see what's uh, what's happening. So, though you're paying that trade off in terms of a slight increased beam width, actually, the data is any easier to interpret. So, again, it's it's, it's a little bit counterintuitive, but it's uh, it's very much beneficial when you're looking at those marginal weather conditions. Okay, that's really as much as I wanted to talk about about the side scan systems. Again. Um, Please feel free to log questions, and we'll um, we'll try and uh, try and see how we go from there. But now to move on to sub bottom profilers, um, and talk a little bit about sub bottom profiling systems, and then I'll tidy up at the end with a little bit on combined systems. So sub bottom profilers, um, the uh, you're essentially looking at the um, the acoustic change in acoustic properties between boundaries causing there to be a reflection of acoustic signal. Um, so the more dissimilar the two um, the, the two layers you're looking at, the uh, the stronger the the reflection. Or if you're looking at an object buried in uh, sediment, so maybe a pipeline, that obviously is very different from the sediment sitting in. So you get a very strong reflection. And again, if you're interested in the sort of theory behind it, it's to do with the uh, seismic wave velocity and the density of the material. It gives you the acoustic impedance. But essentially, it's how similar or dissimilar those media are. Um, what are sub-bottom profilers used for? Uh, typically, uh, looking at mapping, locating mapping hazards, faults, shallow gas. So this is if you're looking at sort of oil and gas drilling applications. Um, locate objects on the seafloor. Uh, pipelines and cables, although that does require you with a conventional sub bottom profiler like these to, to run cross lines. Um, and also, they've been used for mapping natural resources, sometimes for clearance, sometimes uh, for extraction. A uh, nice data example of in the terms of just looking at geology. Um, these, are, these are from uh, some lakes up in, up in New York State. Uh, those again who heard me speak before will heard me comment that you always get nice data in these lakes. So I'm not sure it tells you that much about the performance of a given system, but it gives you a nice data example um, on showing sort of uh, different sediment layers. This be, this layer at the top, I'm told, is the, the sort of just the, the natural deposition over time since uh, uh, this being uh, related to a, an ice age scour. But um, hopefully I've got that bit right. I'm not a geophysicist. But it just does actually show you the nice uh, the way that you can capture nice geology with a with a sub bottom profiler system and understand what's happening uh, beneath the seabed. So the, the, again, as with um, as with side scan, you're playing a little bit of a trade off uh, where lower frequencies provide better penetration, um, but higher frequencies potentially give you more resolution. And the reason I say they potentially is because actually. Chirp theory tells us that the wider the bandwidth, the better the resolution. 
but obviously to get more bandwidth we have to be going across a wider frequency range so we tend to be going up into higher frequencies to get more bandwidth the longer we chirp the longer the pulse length uh, the more acoustic energy you're putting out so again that's potentially beneficial in terms of um, deeper water or trying to get more penetration and we also have to consider the waveform so we look at the, um, the shape of the, the envelope that we, we put around this sweep from low frequency to high frequency because again it's chirp so we're doing this low frequency to high frequency sweep which would be high frequency to low um, and the sweep type so traditional chirp pulses are linear. They, the, you, you, you basically increase the um, frequency you're at over time in a linear manner, manner. Um, but we've also done some sweep types that bias the more time in the lower frequencies. Again, that's aimed at, at improving the penetration that you can achieve. So waveforms, uh, you'll find various waveforms um, on our pulses the historically there's been the fm or standard pulse which is actually a, a, a blackman harris window applied to the data um, it provides really nice sub bottom data uh, it, it's a it's a really good solution um, i've talked to people who, who you know do, do investigations in pulse type and quite often they will just come back and say yes but sub bottom profiling a, a blackman harris window is a, is is, a, is ideal the trade-off you make is because because it it does uh, ramp up relatively slowly at the low frequencies you're not outputting maximum signal level at low frequencies so you're not getting the optimum penetration you can out of the system it gives very nice resolution data uh, gives very nice data in the first few meters if that's what you're interested in but it it doesn't necessarily give you uh, great performance in terms of penetration of the system a wide band pulse um, which is the uh, the next one along that ramps up very quickly uh, gives you fairly even distribution of, of with um, amplitude against against time so you you're, you're waiting all the, the the frequencies pretty much the same um, so you get this flat response you get more low frequency content so you get better penetration but you lose some of the benefits in terms of resolution that you gain with the um, with the with the with the uh, Blackman Harris type FM pulse, uh, you tend to get a little bit more issues with ringing at the seabed and things like that with the wide band pulse. So the one on the right is one that we've been working on, which is a, is, a, is what we call a hybrid wide band. It's um, slightly tapered at the outer ends of the frequency band, so you get most of the benefits of the wide band pulse, whilst also getting some of the benefits of the standard FM pulse. Um, and we've been working on these with um, more recently with uh, quite a bit of success. And tied in with that is the type of sweep. So again, the, the, the plot on the right shows a linear sweep and what we call a quadratic sweep. So you can see that the, the, with the quadratic, you're staying lower frequency for longer and then sweeping up through the high frequencies more quickly. Um, and that again is designed to help improve the penetration that you get out of the system by keep putting more low frequency energy into the water column. Uh, there's also one called logarithmic, which again uh, emphasizes the lower part of the frequency spectrum. So that's quite a bit on pulses. I'm quite happy to talk to people about um, pulse type and pulse selection more widely but um, that gives you the background so you understand a little bit, um, you can understand a little bit more when you look at our pulse names um, and what type of pulses that, that you've got on your systems as to what you're actually um, putting into the water column. We've also developed for some of the newer systems an ability to run a dual pulse configuration. This was originally designed so you could just give a direct comparison between two different pulses so you could um, Select two pulses and it will give you two uh, two data streams, and you can then see which one gives you the best data in the environment in which you're working. Um, the only thing to bear in mind is because what you're doing is alternating between the two uh, the two selected pulses, the um, you're you're halving your long track ping rate for each pulse. So if you're worried about the long track ping rate, um, it's not necessarily a great solution to run that. Those two pulse, that two pulse mode all the time. You may just want to run it, as I said, to establish which um, 
which which pulse is the better of the two and then by selecting no pulse for one you you, you basically revert to a standard uh, a standard system but it's an interesting way of, of allowing people to do a direct comparison without having to go and run keep running the same line again and again with different pulses so the just to, just to reiterate what I've said, um, you know, we're, we're again, we're doing the trade-off of penetration against resolution. Uh, low frequency sources provide penetration. Um, the problem is that lower the frequency, the larger they need to be. Uh, high frequency sources give you more bandwidth, therefore they give you more resolution. Um, they can be smaller and lighter, but they give you limited penetration, especially when you're in coarse sediments. Um, sand in particular, you want to be down uh, down towards two kilohertz or below to get any sort of real performance when you're when you're when you're dealing with areas of coarse sand. So, 3400 towfish, our newest one. Um, this is configured primarily for towing, although there there is an option to put a a, a hole mount bracket on it, as shown on the picture on the right. Uh, it has two 2 to 16 transducers and has a, um, a PVDF receiver array. Sorry, PVDF receiver array. PVDF is a is a material we use in our in our hydrophone receive areas panels now. Uh, it means that we can control the beam pattern much better than we could with the old line arrays. Um, so it provides some um, benefits in terms of signal to noise and therefore the clarity of your data. Uh, there's a built-in motion heave sensor. Um, again, there's a, a pretty standard top side, small top side that can be used with it. And there's a pulse library that gives you a good selection of pulses, the types I've been talking about. Um, as I said, PVDF gives us um, a nice, a nice panel area on the on the bottom of the uh, bottom of the vehicle, and we can set this a relatively large array there. And that means that we can um, we can we can control the uh, beam pattern. Actually, on the 3400, we can switch to a different mode where we use a different part of the panel or a section of the panel, and that allows us to give a um, a larger four aft beam width. So, if we're looking at pipeline detection, where you're looking for the parabolas, as shown in the in the in the lower data example, then that accentuates the length of the legs, the tails, if you like, on those parabolas. So sometimes switching to a large four and a half beam width can be um, can be a useful thing to do. And just to provide a, 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 an example of a 3400 compared with our, our older 3100 system, you can see that you know that 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 improved SNR and cleaner data allows us to clean up and and see things that we were struggling to pick out with the uh, with, with the 3100 become much clearer with the 3400 so it provides some significant improvements over the older systems and that's largely on the back of the improved receive but also by using the dual transmit array um, we also do hull mount systems again this is that we do a variety of these i'm not going to go into it in too much detail at this point um, other than to include a very nice data example we were given by a customer and uh, this 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 shows uh, this was done with a four by four array of two to sixteen kilohertz transducers. Um, interestingly, they operate although this is two to sixteen kilohertz transducers, they operated them at one point five. They they used a one point five to nine pulse, um, which was an old way of cheating and getting more low frequency content. Going back to those pulse shapes, you could use an FM pulse, and basically by the time you got into where the transducer was useful, you'd actually got a decent signal level. So it was a bit of a cheat to do exactly what we do now by being a bit cleverer with the pulse shapes. So um, combined systems, I'm going to try and very quickly, because I appreciate I'm uh, running a little bit over time, I'm going to talk very quickly about some combined systems, uh, which basically take the side scan technology and the sub-bottom profiler technology and put them in a single towfish. So useful when you want to get sub bottom down near the seabed. Um, historically, one of the products we had was the 2050 DSS. That's going to be replaced shortly in the next couple of months by the 2050 DSS, uh, which is a tri frequency. As with the side scan, any two frequencies can be operated at the same time. Um, side scan, 
and a 216 sub bottom profiler and basically put these in a, in a 2000 meter rated um, uh, road body. So you get both uh, both technologies and can get them down and, uh, and, and tow both. There's a larger tow fish, the 2300. Again, offers tri-frequency side scan. Um, with this one, we also build some of these that have the, the symmetry option. Um, and this has a much larger sub-bottom array. It has four one, uh, one to 10 kilohertz sub-bottom transmit transducers and a larger PVDF panel. So this allows you to get much more penetration out of your sub-bottom profiler, um, but it is a much bigger and heavier towfish. It's the, the, the trade-off again of um, trying to trade off against uh, uh, what you're trying to achieve. You, you need large transducers to get the low frequency and to get the penetration. Um, it's also a very flexible tow body in that we can control various telemetry and, and interfaces for third-party sensors. Um, again, we can run um, magnetometers, we can run gradiometers, we can run transponders all off the back, and we can map the whole thing, uh, map the um, serial ports on the bottom end to the top end, so we can run multiple sensors off the bottom end if we need to. So it's a larger tow fish, so there's a little bit more flexibility with it. And finally, just again very quickly, we also do the combined systems on AUVs and ROVs. So if you want to take your side scan sub bottom bathymetry and mount them on a different platform, not on a tow vehicle, we're perfectly capable of um, supplying the hardware for that as well. Um, and that's ranged everything from small man portable type systems, so uh, Ocean Server Iva, Atlas Seacat, um, this is a Remus 600, but also the Remus 100. So basically all the small ones up to much larger vehicles like the Hugins, the Saab Sabertooth, uh, Remus 6000. So again, uh, take full range we've done down to 6,000 meter water depth. Um, in fact, I think we've done some even deeper. And uh, typically, uh, but typically sort of shallow water and, and deeper water systems. And the same, you can take the same, you can put the technology side scan sub bottom on your ROV. Um, here's a couple of ROV examples. It's a side scan on the uh, array up on the flotation, one down, which down on the skid. And we've also done things like the high speed ROVs where, the, where they have the side scan on the side as well. So for hosted platforms, um, we, uh, we can do, again, side scan, sub-bottom bathymetry. We can apply all of the technologies that we do in Towfish and a few others to the, uh, to the systems. And we basically customize them for different uh, host vehicles, which you'll be glad to hear is me finished. So now we had to figure out how to hand back to Harold. OK, thanks, Nick. Um, stop sharing, and I can take over. So let me just double check. Um, so good morning. Um, I'm hoping everyone can see my screen. So we've been doing this for a year, this whole Zoom and go to webinars, and we're still not experts at it. But um, welcome for every everyone attending the, the, the webinar and and I'm hoping today, you know, we can give you a, you know, a nice overview of, of the, both the edge tech hardware and the, and the Chesapeake technology software, you know, to show what's out there. Um, you know, a year ago today or a year ago last week, we were in Aberdeen at, at a trade show and we did one in person. And, you know, it's a little bit different being in person and, and doing a, a go-to webinar. Um, nice thing is we get a lot more people going to these virtual events, you know, we're, we can get 100 people going to a virtual where you get 25 or 30 in person, but you, you do miss something. And so we're hoping to, yeah, at some point go back to the real in person, but for the time being, we'll do this this virtual. Um, my job this morning and this afternoon is to go through the Chesapeake side scan um, processing, the sub bottom processing, and the bathy processing. And I'm going to tag off a lot what what you know was Nick was saying, you know, he did a really good job and I appreciate it. I don't have to talk about any hardware, any 
you know, theory because he did it all. Ironically, I have a few of the same images that he has. I guess it's a good image that we, we start using. A um, few slides to get going and then we'll jump into the program. So who we are, Chesapeake Technology. We started about 20 some odd years ago for side scan data, geophysical stuff. Um, concentrated on side scan and sub bottom. But about 19, uh, 2010, you know, we started going to the bathymetry with the, the uh, interferometry systems and expanded more into bathymetry and LIDAR and single beam. So we, we can cover the entire gamut of, of you know, data spectrum. Our product list is simple. We have a field or an office license, combined license, and the company is small. Um, Maybe there's nine employees. It, it depends if we count our contractors or not. But I opened up an East Coast office in 2019. Uh, the rest of the folks, or the rest, were spread out throughout the U.S. But we have a California office, and you know, we have a few folks out in California. So when we became virtual, we were already a virtual company. Our software, SonarWiz, everything is designated SonarWiz, whether it's SonarWiz side scan, SonarWiz sub bottom. That's just a, you know our branding. So when we talk SonarWiz, it could be any of the, the products, but we could do side scan, bathymetry, sub bottom, and we can do you know combinations. And I'll show through the final products how we can start merging everything together. Um, a simple approach to the products, the, you know, we have our field and office application. Um, most of our, I would say 60% of our, our users are our office application. We can collect the data. Um, when, when Edge Tech is running, we can collect it. Discover is running and we're running. We can do real-time mosaic. But if Discover is going to do all the data collection, we can bring in those JSF files. Not a problem. Um, module, uh, module program. So each one is self-contained. But if you don't need you know, sub-bottom, then you don't get it. You just get a side scan of bathymetry or whatever that is. But it allows you to, to upgrade to, the, you know, to more, more modules as needed. Um, and we have an annual maintenance plan, which is nice to keep up, um, but it's not required because when someone gets a license, they, they own it for life. And the EMA will, will see that it's nice to see the, the latest software, but um, I know folks that have been using software for five or six, seven years, and they like it. They just said, we don't need to change it. The software still keeps going. Our data collection drivers, you know, I broke it into the side scan, sub bottom bathymetry, and you can see, uh, you know, a dozen or so different manufacturers and systems. And we're trying to keep up with the latest, and, and we're always adding new ones. Recently, we just, in fact, added the sub bottom S7K, which is the E20 single beam, but we brought it in as a sub bottom driver. Um, with the analog system, then we have an A to D box. Um, bathymetry, we, we work with most of the bathymetry systems. Um, more so on, on the on the processing side, so on the data collection, and then we have our data processing options, dozens and dozens of different formats. And this is where we, we excel, where we don't have to do any data conversion. We're bringing in these native file formats. And, and whether it, it's the low end, you know, side scan like a hummingbird or the high end edge tech or client, you know, we're handling those fine. Sub bottom, we, we added our version one and version two for SegY. Uh, we did that recently. Um, and we're adding more and more you know, features to our sub bottom. When I go through the sub bottom processing, you, you'll see some of the, you know, we have an auto reflector where you can select the first point, select the last point and, and not, you know, be able to not need to trace the entire reflector. It doesn't work all the time, but it's a nice way uh, of doing an auto reflector tracing. On the bathy side, um, we hold our own for Bathy. We bring in points. We we expanded our, our point cloud, bringing in hundreds of millions of points. We use Octree, so it's it's actually really really fast on, on the display and in the visualization. And a couple of images before I get into the program. Um, so what we can do with the side scan data, um, whether it's it's the main map view on the on number one or the target view, which is the number two, export to Google Earth. Um, we're making these GeoTIFF images. We're enhancing the data. We're cleaning it up, cleaning the bottom track, and the colors and the gains. All our typical side scan application. But what do we do with it at the end of the day? We want to make an export. We want to get a GeoTIFF. We want to get it off, off the machine to, to the end user. And there's a lot of ways we could do it. And I'll go through a, a lot of them today. Um, yeah, we've seen this rack already. <laughs> um, it's a nice rack. And you know, when you get a nice rack, you, you tend to highlight it a lot. But you know. We can do a lot, once we have these, this kind of detail, 
this is where you start seeing what can this side scan actually show? And we're seeing you know, portholes and we can, sometimes we can measure tires. And when we're getting down to measurements of, of, of 10 to 15 centimeters um, and being able to do details like that, you know it's a good quality system, both on the hardware side and, and, and the software side. Um, some of the combined systems on the interferometry, this is a Solster system that has side scan and bathy. Um, it's a typical interferometry where you have a hole in the, in the Bathy system. Edge Tech has their 6205, which fills it, so that's a little bit unique. Um, but we can bring the two in as a side scan, as a bathy, combine them, drape them together. Um, later this afternoon, I'll, I'll do a little bit of the draping. Uh, on our multi beam data, um, bring it in. We can do our patch test. We have our performance tests. One of the nice things about the, the bathy data is, or any of the data, is we're working on the main shell and the main screen. So we're not jumping between programs. I mean, we're going to see everything in our main screen, the contours and the displays. And same thing with the side scan. We're going to see everything. We're not going into different windows. In the single beam, I've actually improved this a little bit in the last you know, month or two and um, to make it a little bit easier to use and, and to keep up with some of the, the industry changes. But whether it's just bringing the track lines or editing the data or gridding it, I mean, there's, there's only so much you could do with single beam. But we, we hold our own for that. And then some of the data export features, um, we, we saw this before with Global Map or, or Google Earth, um, just draping it out or exporting it out. And sometimes you get a really nice image for analysis. Merging data sets, when we get to sub bottom and bathymetry, we can put them together. I have one data set that will do side scan, sub bottom, and bathymetry and put all three of them together. And it's a nice combination of, of getting the, the entire data set and doing some analysis with it. You know, we've expanded up bathymetry to do LIDAR. So here's our LIDAR and multi-beam and side scan, in fact, all in one data set. Files become huge, or LIDAR becomes huge, but these files are, are just really big. Um, so we're seeing more and more of the machines have to get a little bit you know, faster, uh, solid state hard drive, you know, just to keep up with it, um, the, the processing. So, so at this point, I want to go into the program. Um, that was just my my little you know, fifteen or so slides of of the introduction. So I'm gonna cancel out of that and go into my program. Okay. So there's our final product, but <laughs> there's a shipwreck. Um, and how did we get here? Well, just to give you a, a little tutorial of, of Sonar with right now is we have our data acquisition tab for how we're going to do the data collection and our processing tab. And this is where we're going to be playing with most of the day. Um, bathymetry when we start doing some bathy editing and some of the view tabs. Um, in the view tabs, we have some 3D views where we can do it online right in front. But how do we get to post processing? How do we get to the processing you know, features? Well, we have all these different imports. Well, side scan and sub bottom magnetometer. And this is one of the the goals in 2021 is to kind of condense this list a little bit. It, it, it's expanding. We have our forward-looking sonar, and we're going to keep going. And why does it have to be this big? It probably doesn't. So we're going to clean this up. But we're going to bring the data files in. Um, so I have the you know, 45 minutes to go through side scan and, and 45 minutes to go through sub bottom, and I'll do my best. I probably will miss stuff. I'll probably talk really fast, but. Um, as you know, if there's any questions or comments, hopefully good comments, but any questions, you know, let me know. The uh, same thing with anything, questions on the Edge Tech hardware system, you know, you know, send a note out to, to, to Nick or Rich, um, they'll get you. So it, it's not really a pure training session hands-on. It's the 45 minutes. I'm going to show you how we can make a pretty picture. And I have a couple of different data sets. And I practiced last night, and these are the different data sets. I have some, the 6205, I have a multi-beam, I have a co-location of, of side scan, sub bottom, even magnetometer, um, and we're not going to go through the single beam. But the last few li um, lines have been processed. In fact, and when we go through the barges, this would be the the 6205 data. So we'll we'll get through it. One of the other things I want to conveniently point out is I'm running 773. <laughs> um, this has never been shown before. In fact, it was the new build came out yesterday afternoon. Um, I don't think it'll have any issues, but this will be officially released in about a week, maybe 10 days. I'm, I'm thinking by the end of next week, it'll be released. So you have a preview of the latest, latest, you know, updated software.
So how do we get to our side scan? Well, we're going to make a new project, and I'm going to call it Rec UK, because we're in the UK class. Position, every file, when you think about it, except for, you know, I would say, except for high pack HSX files, have latitude and longitude. And we're going to convert it to a UTM or a state plane or some kind of coordinate system. So we want to set the geodesy of this project to what the data is. You can always select a world city. I don't know where this data file was from. So I'm going to get it from the file, and I put it in my side scan rack, and it's the Yankee. So it's in Massachusetts. So what I'm going to do is notice it's 27 and 82. I'm going to just select a file, and it updates it to 4170. So it's going to read from that file the position. 99% of the time it works. Once in a while, there's something in the file it doesn't like. And so we can always go and select from World Cities and, and go into Boston. Um, Boston. Close. How close does this have to be? I'd like to say within 100 miles. Um, if you put in San Francisco, either the data will be really skewed or it won't convert properly. You'll have negative eastings and northings. So it's best to, to get the exact value that you can get. Um, time constant for smoothing when we tow a vessel, uh, tow a fish, you know, we want to do course made good. Um, this will be around a few times, so let's just ignore it for now, and we're going to bring it in. All I did was I created a project um, inside my project folder. We keep all our projects on the C drive in SonarWiz projects, and there's my REC UK. A lot of empty folders out there, some text files. So we're going to start filling up as much as we can. Well, I need some side scan data in here. I could right click on a file saying import. I can go into processing and say import, import side scan files. Or I can take from my Explorer a drag and drop. I'm a little cautious with the drag and drop only because of some of the features that I'd like to or settings I'd like to do. So I'm just going to do the right click, import the files. And in this case, you can, before I selected one to set the position, now I'm going to set, select as many as I want. File type specific. I say we can read our native file formats or the manufacturer's native file format, but they're not always constant. They're not always, I wouldn't say correct. There's different flavors. So in the JSF, there's different values you could use. Um, I can use this XTF as an example. Where's the position coming from? Which type packet, 42 or 100? We have auto. But if there's two different types and you want a specific one, you can force it in. I like to say most of the time just go by the defaults, but what really is a default? I was doing some stuff last night with a, a Norbit data, and I had it on 7006, and it didn't work. came up with a little red error message. I went to auto, and it worked fine. So I know I practiced on this, and it worked fine, but we have to keep one eye on the, the file specific once in a while. In the advanced settings, there's my 300 again, and we're still going to ignore it here because we're going to do it down there later on, is when we start putting the data in, the, the file itself is full amplitude data, but the import samples per channel, how many samples are we going to put down per channel? 1024, 2000, 4000. You only have so many pixels on the screen, so you might be overdriving it, but you know, the files get bigger. You'll get higher resolution on some of them. Some of them will look exactly the same. So we'll keep it 1024. And I can do some data compression, you know, none to 8-bit scaled. And we can practice and play and see that 1024 with you know, none versus 4096 and, and scaling, you can see that there's a huge difference in, in the file size. When we bring the data files in, we're making our CSF files, our Chesapeake Sonar files, or compact Sonar files. So there is a conversion going on, but it's our conversion. We're going to bring it in. So Every side scan, whether it's a edge tech, a Klein, a Hummingbird, they're going to become CSF files. In fact, sub-bottom becomes CSF files. Bathymetry becomes CDF files. It's a little bit different flavor, um, but that's our file type. So I'm going to select, OK, I can bring in high and low frequency, one, two, three, four. And then, of course, we added the five, six for the tri-frequency. Um, we're going to bring in a pair at a time. I'm not going to bring in one, two, three, four. I'm just going to bring in one, one channel, one pair of sentences. And I'll say OK. And there's my data. If I wanted to bring in, if we look at our data itself, it's channels one, two. If I wanted to bring in the, the, the high frequency, I can bring them in as well. I can bring in 
two files in and select high frequency. And there's my high frequency data. That's the high and that's the low. We're going to work with the low frequency. So when we first started, I, I had a really nice image on the screen. I was like, how do we get to that? Well, with side scan, your job is to image enhance. You know, the bottom track is okay, not the best. There's a little gap over there. There's a reflector out there. And plus, I really don't like the colors. You know, traditionally, we could be um, how I learned side scan, grayscale, like an inverted. And then now everyone all of a sudden goes to, to copper color. So we'll go into bronze and invert it. So we have a lot of data files. In fact, one of the data sets I use will have hundreds and hundreds of files. Um, and we just want one file. The bounding box is the one that it's selected on. And I'm just going to practice on one file. I'm going to say it, just this one. And say, I just want to make this one the best that I can. So I want a bottom track. Oh, right click, bottom track. And that bottom track itself does a really good job when it reads the file. But what happens if there was no bottom track? And there's my bottom track out there. We can start doing some auto bottom tracking. And if we notice, if I scroll down there, I get my range value. And the range is 8, 9, 10 meters. So I'm going to do a blanking zone, not 10 meters, but I'm going to do it 2 or 3 meters, just to get rid of anything that's in close to the, the, the first return or close to the trigger. And then there's a threshold, what kind of value I'm looking for, you know, for, you know, change to find the bottom. And I could track the bottom. Notice that we're going to find a couple of little fishies out there. So I can change my threshold a little bit higher and drop it down. At some point, you get to the point of your threshold is so high and you don't want to go any higher because sometimes you'll go into the water. You could just go ahead and remove the points and clear it out that way. One of the things we've been doing in SideScan is drop the bottom track a little bit deeper into the seam, into this the bottom return. So when I put the values together, it, it gets a little bit clearer. So the seam goes a little bit, you know, hidden a little bit. So I'll put in a half a meter. So we're dropping it down a little bit. I'm going to apply and go to the next file. The next file found, there's a couple little you know, issues out there. I want to remove the points. Um, when anything's in the water column with side scan, the bottom track just doesn't like it very well. I'm going to put in the half meter, apply. And that's our two bottom track lines. So we saw that the seam got a little bit better. But we're still seeing issues with the colors and gains. So I'm going to take my, my one file, right click, and I'm going to look at my settings. I have different gain settings, BAC and AGC and TVG, EGGM. We actually have a webinar in, in a few weeks that go through this one slide. What's the difference between all these different gains? Um, in the past, we would say, OK, just use TVG and hit apply. You notice that it balanced out a little bit better. Well, is that the best one we want? Well, if we do this EGN table, I'm going to say I'm going to select the just the low frequency, and I'm going to say LF. Here's a new button that just came out. Um, probably won't press it. If we had a, a hundred different files, and I wanted a one EGN table per file, because right now we're looking at the entire data set and basically taking an average. But if you had varying terrain and you want to have different EGNs, we can automatically collect and create these EGN tables per file. EGN files aren't really large, so it, it's not taking up a lot of space. And it's going to go ahead and build a table. And I'll hit apply. And starts to, you know, again, what we're trying to do is balance out the light and dark. We have a strong pulse at Nader, and it, it, you know, the time as it goes towards, you know, further out at 50 meters, 100 meters, the gain you know, diminishes. So we want to enhance the gain a little bit. We could do a little bit of de-striping filter. You know, there's some up and downs up here. It's a little bit of a smoothing. Just be careful with it because it might smooth it out too much. What I also see out here is, is there's a reflector out there. We don't need this box anymore. But out here, there's some kind of reflector. I really don't like it. And we want to measure, measure on the map. From Nader out, it's a 50 meter rain scale, but the reflector is showing up about 38, 37 meters. Um, we don't know what it is, but we don't want it part of our data. So I can go up in here and go into a just displayed range rather than the 50 meters. I'm going to do 38 meters. And they don't have to be balanced, but in this case, I'll put 38 meters on both sides. And that cleans that up.
and we compare it to the, the original file, <laughs> well, that's what it, we started with. Um, but we, what we don't want to do is go through this for each of the lines. So there's an option inside side scan where it says make others like this. We can take all the settings where it's the EGN in the display range, whatever have the values you have. If you have layback and cable app, you're practicing on one file and you're applying that offset if you want to all the other files. I'm just going to apply all the settings. There's an OK button down there, which because of the, the screen setting, I can't really get to it. So we'll push it off to the other screen. And I'm going to apply everything to everyone else. So that's getting better. Yeah, you know, we can get nitpicky, and I can say, well, there's a little bit of a gap between these two files, and then start and stop a file. It just something happened. We missed a ping. There's a heading issue. Probably more of a heading issue. So when I right click in in, in Sono, is a lot of things happen. If I right click on a file, we saw that and make others like this and adjust display range. If I right click on a main map, um, batch bottom track, I didn't get to that, but coverage reporter, or we can do e export if we want. But if I select the two files, I get a different menu item. And I'm going to fix small interfile gaps. Doesn't seem like it did much, but that little interfile gap disappeared. So it's a nice way of cleaning things up. Zoom extent gets us out there. So we just want to make a mosaic. We haven't done any targeting or anything else. We want to make a mosaic of this. What you see on the screen is what you get. And I say that because we have our, our scale bar out there. So just before you make your mosaic, we go into the view and, and, and we get rid of the map scale. I have a compass rose. We can start doing rotation. Um, if I wanted to rotate everybody by 45 degrees, um, I can rotate. Um, but we don't need the compass rows. We don't want to rotate anybody. We'll, we'll go back to the the, the north up. There should be a north up button there. And this is what we want to export out. Processing. We did the import, but now we're doing the export. Under the export, probably not the best naming convention. I say making mosaic, but say project is geo image. And because it says project, if we do bathymetry or sub bottom, anything we see on the screen, the sub bottom would be interesting because it's up and down, but anything that's on the screen, you can save as a geo reference image. I must have been playing. Um, I'll do a half a meter. Just be careful of the size, or you can do small, you can do 25 centimeters. We had a, a customer say we wanted to do two and a half centimeters. It's like, yeah, I suppose we could do it. And, and it just, the files were huge, but if somebody really wanted to make a two centimeter mosaic, we can do it. A lot of the side scan systems, you're either towing it too fast or, or the resolution isn't that good and you're just overdriving the side scan. But let's use 25 centimeters. We're starting to fill up some of the folders. So it's on always Project UK. Now we're in the GeoTIFF subdirectory and it's going to inherit the project name. I can change it to anything I want. Um, and I just want to see what I'm saving at the end. So I'm just going to launch the viewer. This takes about three seconds. And there's my geo reference image. Well, how do we know it's geo reference? Well, I can take my image off. I can bring in my geo image and make sure that it's UK class. Oh, see, SonoWiz project, date modified, geo tiff. There's my UK rec. And if we notice the position, this is a it's a geo reference. How else do we know that it's a geo reference? If I export the data to Google Earth, and I'm going to use that same one, I'm going to launch Google Earth upon completion. It's going to, it's on my other screen, I'll move it over in a second. And it's going to be somewhere in Massachusetts, Cape Cod. And there's my image. So we're just making a geotiff image. That's yeah. I get that little data. Sorry. 
But in addition to the side scan mosaic, you know, I want to do one more mosaic output, and then we're going to go into targets and, and, and look at that. And then we'll go to a different data set just to give a different flavor of it. Um, if I didn't want the entire image, there's two lines here, but I only wanted a portion of this shipwreck, we can create a feature. I'm going to add in a feature. Now, we have a lot of these features, feature managers, contact contact managers, um, bathymetry. We have managers for the side, uh, tide and sound velocity. So. We have these managers. If I first bring it in, there's nothing to manage. So we're going to go ahead and create it. I'm going to add in a feature. I'm going to do a, a line polygon. And I'm going to say, well, just around here is the only thing that I want a mosaic. And I'll close it. And remember what I said, what, if you make a mosaic, you're going to see what's on the screen. But in this case, I probably want to keep it on. I want to see what the bounding box is. So under the export, GeoTIFF image is going to, again, keep the same name. So I'm just going to call it clip. And rather than do a do not crop, I'm actually, I have to turn my Well, it should have said something. OK, this is the issue with the, the latest software. Um, let me try one more thing. Close. Maybe that was it. Geo image. Here we go. I had to close the polygon. And I'm going to call it clip. In the color bit resolution, is one of the little things that we eventually learned. We have eight. 12 and 24 and 32, we really want to do 32 bit because in the next project, when we start draping the bathymetry and side scan and sub bottom, you know, we want to do the transparency layer. Yeah, um, so we, we need that extra bit. So um, the files get a little bit bigger. I like to just by default use 32 bit. Uh, I'll launch the view after saving so we can see what it is. And there's my, my clip dot image. <laughs> One of the things we can do in, in, in Sono is, is if we zoom to the extent and I say, well, that's my screen right now. This is what you would get for for the mosaic, um, whatever you see on the screen. So I go into the zoom extent and, and get everything. Well, besides the, the the data itself, we have a couple of little targets. We have this one and this one. And I want to measure and, and contact and create these contact reports. Well, I have a contact manager. But there's nothing going to be in there because I haven't created any contact. I'm going to have to create a context. I'm going to capture a contact, and I'm going to select it on this one. And what it does is it brings up my digitized window. And the, the, the crosshair is co-located, so I'm going to select out there. There's my first contact, and I'll make this one as another contact. I'll do a couple. Um, there's another one, a little square block. Don't be overly, overly concerned that it has to be exactly on because we can clear it up and, and, and do things later on. The next line, we can, the green arrow to the next line, that's probably the other frequency. Um, so we're just scrolling through. So I started with the second one, went to third, fourth, went back to the first one. But if there was a contact and the data was overlap, you would see the contact in this digitizing view. The other thing about this digitizing view is you can see the water column. I can slant range correct it or not. Where in this main window, all you're going to see is, is the bottom tract, whatever value it is. The other thing we see here is this contact. We have these big words of, of contact. Well, if I go to my contact manager, draw the labels. Well, I don't want to have the labels. All of a sudden, the labels disappear. Or maybe we'll keep it that way. We don't need the names of the contacts. We want to do the measuring. We want to you know, at least capture them. We want to submit a report for the GeoTIFF image. We want to submit a report for a contact. So there's my contacts. It's, it's somewhere over there. There's my contacts. I have three contacts. I can go to my contact manager. Sometimes just double clicking brings up values. So I'm going to start measuring. I'm going to zoom in a little bit. Shadow is is black. Depending on the color palette, shadows could be white or black. In this case, the shadows are black. I said, don't worry about the exact position because I can always move the contact. I want to move it slightly over there. I didn't really move it much, but I moved it a little bit. I measure my length. 
with the cursor, my width with the cursor, and my shadow. Left click and drag. Now here's something that's really subjective. I might see it at this way, someone else might see it this way. So side scan, this, this contact is 61 centimeters. Isn't a precise science. It's going to get you close, but it's not going to get you exactly what you are. And I'll say, okay. With the contact, I didn't have to close out. I, all I can do is go to you know, next and do the same thing up here. Length, width, and I have my three contacts. And there's my second one, 33 centimeters. I'll say next. That's a nice little square block. It recenters nicely. Length, width, and the shadow. The shadow. Forty centimeters. So we have our three contacts. Two things I want to do. One, I want to export it out. I want to see these contacts as a report. Um, and then we're going to do a database query. Well, you know, one of the NOAA requirements I had when I was on the ship was find all the contacts that are at least one meter high. Well, if you have hundreds and hundreds of contacts, you don't want to go through all of them. You, you, there's an easy search engine that we have. So the first thing we want to do is just create a contact report. And I'm going to create a, you know, uh, I'll do a new report. I'll call it contact, PDF. I have different format, HTML, yeah. Google Earth. Um, I'll just finish up here. It's building the report. And it's this is just one of many different reports that we could do. It's thinking. And there's my contact report. And there's a little block on it. If we didn't want that, we would have to you know, disable that as well. Um, but it's a nice way of getting all this information out. I could also do the one more thing I want to do for a reason. Um, contact report generator. I'm going to make an HTML. I'll that. Oh. Finish. And in this, in this case, I'm making these HTML projects because we can do, we can say this is this my HTML value and it's a little bit of all this information. But why bother doing that? I can take the entire project and, and if someone doesn't have sonar where they want to see it, well, unless they get a license, they can't see the data. But we can export out this whole thing as a website. We're not going to publish it on, on, on the internet, but we can make this as an HTML. So there's my, I'm going to put in my web directory. I'm going to include the image for the project. And I'll show you what this does in a second. It's going to create this is HTML page. And there's my contact information. There it is. Oh, we don't need this right now. There's my data. But one of the things is if I look at my side scan itself and I select out there, I can go up and down. And without having the raw data, this is just an image capture. But if somebody wanted to analyze the data or see the data, more than just a, a, J, uh, a geo image, image, they can have this. So there's my, my contacts or my side scan data. It, it's a nice way of you know, allowing someone else to view the data. You say, well, why would you do this? Because all of a sudden, no one needs a Sono with license anymore. Well, hopefully, the folks would still get it. There's all my contact information. Um, contact, where it, you can see all the information right on the screen. So it's a nice little viewer. Pretty well, went through this data set uh, a, a lot. There's a few other little tricks that we could do. You know, when I had this, this the color I issue itself, I said, well, everything else is MSTL bronze. But what happens if I just wanted this one file as a different color? Well, bottom up here, we on the bottom left, we have this, this tab out there that has a lot of information. 
sometimes it gets a little bit busy. Sometimes it's it, it's so much that I actually just drag it out there so I can see a lot more information. Well, you have this this color out there, which is the same color as this. But maybe I don't want to use MSTL bronze. I want to use different color for that one file. I could always go ahead and say, well, I want that one file to be gray. So all of a sudden I have different colors. So if you wanted to highlight a file or a specific file, we could do it that way. When I have overlapping files, I have this swipe where I can go ahead and swipe. If there was something underneath, we can actually see some stuff, values underneath, and the next data file would have it. Inside this general tab, I, I can take my my two files and I'll multiple select in the display and I'll open up in 3D. Well, really, what is 3D for, for side scan? Not much except for rotation. There's my 3D window out here. Let's bring it up here. And here's my 3D window. My next project, when we go to the bathymetry, I'll have the 6205 where I'll actually have depth. And then I'll start draping the side scan over the depth so we get some elevation. But right now, all it is flat. You can rotate it. But that's our 3D window. Inside the general, we have on the bottom this course made good 300. Remember I said in the beginning, don't worry about the 300. Well, we could always change it. There's 100 if we want, where we can start very, very slightly. But if I put in, there's no course made good, there's zero. Just take the individual position, things go all over the place. So we can't do that. We, we, we need some kind of value. So is it 200? Is it 300? 300, is, as by default, looks pretty good. There's my 300. There's no values. Again, I can do multiple select and keep everyone together and have 300 out there. Also in the general is the layback. If we want to do layback, if I have a sheave offset. So this properties tab actually is pretty important. Um, general and the display. There's some other values in here. There's a static offset. If you want to do a static gain, I can put it in there. And what's inside the acoustic file, there's some, some information, a number of samples and file resolution. So we don't always need it. Sometimes I just leave it on the bottom. But we will get to it at, at certain points. I wanted to change the color back. It has nothing to do with this main scale. I have to go back to the display and just go back into global. And there's my color palette. OK, so we pretty well used this data set up uh, enough. Um, another 15, 20 minutes of a side scan. I wanted to use a different project. Um, and, and I have this, we have side scan barges. Um, I'll, I'll start with this one just so I can get a little bit more of the side scan. Um, actually, what I to show you the, the difference, so I've written everything. There's my my side scan data, and because it's a JSF file with the um, bath and, and side scan high and low frequency, um, we can bring it in three different times. I'm going to make a new project. I'll call it Rogers UK. I kind of opened up on the project, so. If you know that the geodesy is correct, I don't have to do get from file. It's automatically going to remember what it is. If I bring it in and everything's fine, I'm waiting to bring it in. I realized that my geodesy was not correct. It wasn't Florida. It needed to be something else. I don't have to make a new project. I can hit this little blue button up there and go ahead and change the values. So I can basically say, okay, I really messed up in the beginning. I want to change it. We at least try to, um, clean things up. One of the things that side scan data is image enhancement, but sometimes the image isn't really good. So this is where we have to start cleaning things up. This is where the position isn't really good. So on my side scan, right click, import a file. Okay. Um, and I can bring them all in or just one file. There's my file. Now, on, to, on the data itself, you know, it was collected on board of both this offset. And here's the issue when, when you start bringing in, I'll, I'll, I'll bring in two just to see if I can make a, make a point. Things started to get all over the place. If I can use my little swipe. 
there's a little bit of an offset there. It's because on the boat, you know, there's an XY offset. How do we clean it up? Well, if we know what the offsets are, we can we can put it in. I think it was three meters. I can go up in here and say, well, in my general, I'm going to put in a, a, a Um, I'll turn the head on. I'll put in a, I think it was X three meters or maybe two. We'll see if that moves it. Yeah. Uh, close. The idea that because it's fixed now and, and there's offsets, we're going to have to worry about what the offsets are. I have a text file that tells me exactly what the offsets are. We can kind of guess what they are. Um, when I bring in the bathymetry, it's actually going to read in, in the value from the bathy, so we'll be fine with that. But let's just do this one file. Remove this one. And, and I want to remove it from the yes. Let's just make this a nice image because we're going to need this later on when we start doing the draping of the side scan and bathy. So I want to prepare this this one geotiff image. So just as before, right click. I'm going to bottom track. Um, Let's see what happens when I track it. Cleaned it up pretty well. Here's a case where the side scan is right on top of a feature in the water column. So maybe in this case, EGN may not work because it assumes that the altitude is the same across. So we'll see what the EGN you know, looks like. We may not be able to use that kind of gain setting. I'll say apply and I'll close out. I didn't do the, 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 the little bit further adjustment. I can go back into bottom track and just say, well, I really want to put in a half a meter. You don't have to do it, but you'll notice that it does tend to make the image look a little bit better. Just be careful. You don't want to put something too large in there. Now we go back in and we go in our, and look at our gains. And what happens when we do EGN? That's just one table. I'll call it low frequency. And apply. It actually did a good job. Sometimes I notice when there's a rock or something in the middle, it assumes that you know the value, the altitude, because EGN has an X and Y axis. The Y axis is altitude, so it's measuring the altitude. In fact, I could show as the example where this looks pretty good. If I go back up in here in my bottom track, and I'm going to remove uh, clear all, remove the bottom track. EGN is not going to like it because it's all of a sudden it's going to recompute in EGN. And what happened? Well, we would have to go back in, up and up on the settings and rebuild the table. Start. Yes. And I get it back. So you can see the EGN is really sensitive to bottom track. So hence, when we start processing data, we do bottom track first because things rely on bottom track, the contact position, EGN. So when I start processing, I'd like to say, doesn't matter the order we go in. Well, it doesn't for certain gains and certain issues, but I always say do bottom track first. So I'm gonna track the bottom, put in my half a meter. It's going to rebuild it, it's all black. I'm gonna go back in and just rebuild this EGN table one more time. We can notice that um, if there were some kind of issues at the end, we can trim the data. And if I right click on the data, we have this adjust display range, but I also have this trim. Trim ends with a sonar mouse. But if I, I only want a portion of it, yes. And that part of the data is gone. I can split a file if I want put two files together. There's certainly a lot of tools that you can do within the site scan itself. So we went ahead and I'm just going to go on the export, save as a geo image. I'm gonna make it 32 bit and keep this for later on. Oh, 25. We're gonna keep this for later on because when we start doing the draping, we'll see it. Because right now, if I go into my display under my 3D view, view, 3D. It's pretty flat, and you can cheat with this vertical exaggeration, but all that's doing is is taking the altitude and expanding it out. 
you know, there's a barge out there, but then it, it flattens out. So that's not a valid thing. We need our, our battery depth. And in fact, there's a barge out there in the back where it doesn't even pick up the altitude or the height. So we're going to worry about that you know, later this afternoon. And finally, the last data set I wanted to show, which gives me a good segue into sub bottom, is a combined side scan sub bottom data set. And it's a co located data set. So I'll call it co locate. And all these data sets that I'm showing are on our website as sample files. Um, and so feel free to grab them if there's any questions where they are, just let me know. So co locate, I'm going to get from a file. I'm going to go back to my desktop training data UK class. There's my code. And these are XTF files. Now, when I first find the position, it doesn't matter sense of specific format. It doesn't really matter. It's looking for latitude and longitude or easting and northing. Um, and I'll say, oh, there it is, <laughs> back in Massachusetts, 70 and 42. The coordinate source, auto, use fish position, ship position. Sometimes there's two positions. You always want to use, you know, you want to know where the tow fish is. Um, but if we're doing some kind of layback computation, it depends what values in it. We might want to use ship so we can apply the layback. So although I say use the defaults a lot, always think about what the defaults have to, you know, are, are part of it. A lot of the times, most of the time, I love, love to use UTM, but there's different coordinate systems that we can go into. Um, so there's different values, Australia or different map values. So we're not limited to UTM. Sometimes it's just easier. Say, okay. And when, once again, we start a new project. One of the things I want to show is this, this options up there. This is my global settings, where my file options and sub bottom options, um, advanced settings, you might come into here at, at some point to do certain things. Um, and the file options, if I had data files in and I want to bring them in again, it'll give me an alarm saying it's, it's your file already exists. So I usually enable the overwrite existing files. If I want to show the, the track line, I can show event file names on the map, um, different color values. So this is your global settings that we get to once in a while. So I'm going to go ahead and bring in my side scan data. And there's my XTF files. It doesn't take too long to read them. And some of the some of the files I've noticed do take long. It takes a few seconds of when it's thinking about drawing on the screen. And there's my overlap. There's my data itself. Um, one of the things we have now is this option on this overlap mode shine through average cover up root mean square. We can see it's definitely a cover up. Let's do the root mean square, kind of blends it a little bit. There's some rocks in the middle of it. Um, and I'm gonna have some sub bottom lines directly underneath it. So let me just process and go through this and then we'll go into the sub bottom. So we pick a line. Well, the first thing I say is we always want a bottom track. Sometimes bottom track comes in, sometimes it doesn't. When I look at my bottom track, it comes in pretty well and it even follows the route. Do you have to bottom track or view it? You don't have to. But once I hit apply and say okay, notice that it gets highlighted in black. It just says it's been bottom tracked. You can work on the data regardless of it's bottom track or not. But it's always a good idea to, to at least visually check the bottom track to make sure everything's okay. And apply. And next, and I'm not sure if there was a fish in this one or not. I think most of this was, yeah, this is a really good data set in terms of bottom track. It, it captured it well enough, even around the small little rock at, at, at Nader. This should be the last line. When it gets to the last line, it says, I'm all done. Okay, it goes back to the first one. I don't really need to worry about that. But here's the case where I want to practice on one. I want one file to make it really good, 
but it's really complicated here. So I'm just going to select a random file. Okay. Well, I can disable everybody. Or I can right click and say isolate. And that's the one I'm going to make sure I clean up. So what were the gains we used or what were the settings we used? We used uh, our settings and I, I tried the TVG and I said, okay, let's see what TVG looks like. It's okay, it's still, it's a little bit dark, but we can see the, the different colors here and bottom types. What happens if we use EGN? Notice that it's showing all the files here. I can create one or I can just say collect, show all and low frequency. This the EGN tag, EGN and BAC take a few extra seconds. Um, yeah, there's, there's, once it's done, we have an EGN table for the system. We don't have to create it every time. If I brought in another file, I can just say apply this EGN table to it. And I'm hit apply. It actually darkened it up a little bit. Hmm. What about the, the, these little bumps along the track? Maybe I want to go up in here under this settings and use some de filter and keep it by the default of 50, see what happens. Um, we start to see some a little bit of an artifact out there. It has to do with the gain and the, and the smoothing. So if I turned off EGN and turned on TVG, and still have that destripe filter, would I still have that kind of artifact? Probably, yeah, it's still there a little bit. But at the end, I, I want to have this EGN and I want to have my destripe filter. Maybe I'll turn it down a little bit to, you know, 30. And then I take this, this value and apply it to everybody across the board. We can see the bottom track probably wasn't really good right there. And we can always go back up in the file and always go back and if the bottom track isn't perfect um well there's the value right there it did a good job out there i'm going to take this one file make others like this check all the settings or check all the files apply all the settings again the okay buttons on my other screen i'm going to have to just move it over and say okay and because it went quickly it's because nothing is on the screen it just said okay apply it once i enable everybody all of a sudden now it takes all those values and starts processing the data um, so when we bring this data in you know practice on one or practice use one file make it really nice and clean and, and then apply it to everyone On the screen itself, uh, we have this overlap mode, but there's also this drawing mode. And I have this draft mode and high resolution mode. And what's the difference? Um, I would say the high resolution, it gives you the better quality, but it also takes a, you know, an extra half a second or a second. If you have a lot of files, it takes a little bit longer. When I export out data as, as a geo image, it's always gonna use a high resolution. It's just really on, on the screen, what I'm drawing, how long it's going to take. You can't really tell the difference between draft mode and, and high and high resolution mode, but it's there. We also have in this, this drawing mode navigation. If I wanted to see the, the track lines. And we had our little green button up there. If I wanted to show the file names on the map, we could show that as well. File names have gotten really big, just like the data files. So I usually turn the file names off. And I'll go back to my side scan and I'll put it in my high resolution mode. One of the other features we have before I jump to sub bottom is if we look at the native section, it, you can kind of see a little bit of a seam. Well, there is another option in, in settings where it's enable this filter. It says, okay, look down. And, and get rid of something. There's, there's an option up on top, let me clear out of that for a second, um, under the processing native transparency where I can actually make a hole in the data. We don't make a hole in the data in this case, I don't have enough overlap. Other projects, when you have 200%, you're actually covering it up. In this case, 
I, I have someone else, but I don't want to make a hole in. So let's just go back up in here under settings and, and use this native filter. And again, because we made a change to this one, we could do one at a time or we can apply all the settings. Right click, make others like this. Somewhere in here is it. Sometimes I just say apply all settings. Um, it's not going to double apply anything. It's just going to you know take the, the, the last change that you made. What I'm trying to do is make the image as clean as, as best as possible to, to ignore the fact that we have multiple lines and it's just a single line or a single image that we're going to export out. That blue line is just the bounding box. Let's just remove it out there. Um, in the color palette itself, I have all data, auto on this data, or a manual, where I can go ahead and you know, take in any values that I want, high and low. Um, sometimes you play so much that at the end of the day, you say, OK, I just want to use auto. Before I was using auto all data, Auto this data says, okay, just look at the min max range for each of the individual lines. Maybe it, it, it's cleaning a little, up, cleans it up a little bit better. And just before I finish out up here, I'm going to make an export because I'm going to start using this to drape over the bathy and, the, and, and use for sub -bottom. So I'm going to make my geo image 32 bit. I'll use half a meter and there's my co locate UK as an export. So we're going to save that for later. Probably could have done one meter, but that's fine. So these XTF files, XTF is a pretty broad you know, file format that holds, it's designed for side scan, but it holds sub bottom, it holds bathymetry, not very well. It, it holds magnetometer, it holds everything. So this XTF file also has sub bottom data. And so we're going to bring in the same XTF files again, but not as side scan, we're going to bring them in as sub bottom. Hmm. Um, bring in the sub bottom data. Um, same thing, I'm going to go in and look at the data. I'll go bottom track first, then I can do the image enhancement. Or I can do the image enhancement first and then bottom track. I'm going to digitize some layers and then I can export out the, the, the values and do some volumes between, you know. The bottom return in the first layer and, and export out that. Okay, so I created my my value of my export. Don't need that. I actually don't even need my side scan data. I'm going to import import the files themselves. And here's my XTF files. Channels one and two. I played with some data the other day with one and two. So just be careful which channel you want. File specific. List looks different. Um, XTF is pretty straightforward. When you get to seg Y, things get a little complicated um, because there's different bytes that we could use. So you use a program called CC, SEI, -E SEE, to see, you know, to debug and, you know, which values. We're trying to come up with the best, you know, values that we think. I would say in this case, it's probably about 90% of the time it's okay or 80%. Sometimes we have to go up in here and change the bytes. Um, bringing the data, nothing else really is exciting out there, and I'm going to open up the files. Unlike side scan, when I first bring the data in, um, there's really not a whole lot to see in, in terms of data. We're, we're seeing you know, it's a vertical wall. It's up and down. So we'll see track lines. Before, when I said high draft mode and high resolution mode, in this case, it defaults to navigation plot. And what we're going to see on the screen will be the six or seven track lines. Come on. There's my lines. Now everyone says, well, where's my data? Well, it's up and down. But I want to see the data in the screen. Well, we, we can cheat a little bit. And this is really, really cheating. And then the view under the drawing mode under the sub bottom it defaults to navigation but if i put in draft mode 
what I'm doing is I'm turning the side side the sub bottom on its side. Um, I haven't put any gains, but when I get a couple of gains in there, we'll, we'll start seeing it. So it doesn't really buy anything because the navigation or the position isn't correct. It's supposed to be going up and down. So in the sub bottom itself, double click or right click, bottom track, digitize. It's all the same. Pro it's on the other screen. It's all the same program. It's just a different tab. So there's my bottom track, acoustic reflectors. Well, I don't see any data. Well, where's my data? Well, sometimes the data comes in. Sometimes I have to go into some gain settings. And just to, I'll use some AGC, see what happens with an AGC. Up. Sometimes we actually have to apply some gain settings so we can just see where we're going. But that red line is your bottom track. And the goal is to get this red line down to the bottom. There's my data. Notice that the little red line didn't touch. So we have to go actually go back to bottom track and track all. It went up there. Well, if I look at my, my blanking, yeah, it's a little bit too high. Um, how high or how low should I go? Show info at toolbar. If I scroll down there, depth that cursor, 23 meters. Well, I may not want to use 23, but on the bottom tracking, I want to have my blanking a little bit more and see if I can drive it down a little bit. And there it is. If it misses out there, I can always insert a point out there. Oh, sorry, remove the points. And insert. Hmm. It would have been nice if I could insert a point. Um, so we we go through this data set, and but all of a sudden, it's like side scan, be careful with the threshold. Threshold is too high. So what happens if I put in two, and I say track all? So I have my my first return. I force it down, and a threshold. Um, then you get once in a while you get a little leftover. So I'm going to have to go ahead and remove this point left click to left and to drop it in. And I'm gonna do this for all the data sets. A couple of features that we have is this, my little scrolling bar out there where I can start to zoom in a little bit tighter. That That's new in, in 772, 771. So we're gonna to start to see the data. And we'll do this for all the data sets, but while we're here, I want to show there, there's some reflectors out there. And there's a couple of things that are going on. My bottom return, sometimes we want to make this as a reflector. If I want to do um, under reflectors, yes. I want to compute thickness, maybe from the bottom to the first return. Well, this isn't a reflector, but I can go to the bottom tracking and make a reflector out of that value. Now, when I downsample, it's how many dots do you want? Right now, it's a continuous line. If I put in one, you're going to get a sample for every one. We don't need that. A little bit of efficiency, a little bit of everything else. But if I put in 10, for us, make reflector, and I put in 50, we can see the dots. So the idea is we don't need every sounding point. But when I start looking at my reflectors, there's a, there's a nice little reflector out there. I'm going to go into my acoustic reflector, and I'm going to make the easiest way, worry about this a little, little bit, we're going to make a new reflector. And I'm going to call it reflector, or I'll just call it R1. And I'll make it green. I could left click and left click and left click. And the pencil means it's active. I right click, I can skip a space, and then left click again. I can double right click and that cancels everything. Alternatively, I can say a new one, and I'll call this yellow, and I'll call it R2. I can take my pencil and just draw a line. And again, I have the pencil. Right click stops it. I can start up again and double right click stops it again. But I have a lot of reflectors and I don't want to do everything by hand. So I have this 
I have a new one called Auto Fill. So it, it toggles on and off. If I say I want to do the setup and smooth reflector or use point spacing, I'm going to use 20. That's those those dots that we saw where we had 25. If I turn it on, notice it's, it's, it's enabled. That's the only tricky part. I'm going to say it's a new one, and I'm going to call it R3. And I'll make this for the sake of colors um, purple. If I take the first point, it puts an anchor. And I put a last point out there. Like I said, sometimes the bottom auto track works and sometimes it doesn't. But that's how it's, it's designed that it's going to find double right click. It's like, well, I should be able to do it. I'm going to delete that one. I'll start it again. Oop, make a new one. Start it again. And I'll put it out there, see if it tracks halfway. And then I'll do it out there. And I'll do it out there. So sometimes end to end is a little bit tougher. Sometimes we go into media. But the whole editing, and if I double right click, I clear it out. The editing mode is, is pretty easy. If I didn't like this up there, all I would have to do is double click. And I can move my points. Oop, I'm in my mode. I'll do this one. Double click. I can move my my values out anywhere I want. So editing out this the reflectors are easy. Well, what do we do with reflectors at the end of the day? Well, we can display them. We we have them on the main map. I believe we should be able to see them on the. Well, there's my bottom track. We, we'll see the reflectors on it itself. And if we look at the the features. The reflectors are actually features. We call them features. But I want to do, in, in this case, compute the thickness. What is the thickness between these two? What is the thickness between these two? So in my compute thickness, I'm going to go from my C floor to my R1, compute thickness. Or my compute thickness from maybe from R2 to R... Compute thickness. R1 to R2. Huh, I don't know where my thickness is. But we can get these different thicknesses out there. And again, they're all going to be inside my reflectors. There's my thickness value out there. Where if I want to enable it on and off, it's actually it's, it's, a, it's a reflector that or reflector, it's a feature that we put out there. So we, we're going through all this, and then and, and in the next 20 minutes, I'm going to have to finish up. But the idea is that we want to do everything quickly. You know, we have this stuff. So if we go back into the sub bottom, I don't need my features right now. If I go into my sub bottom and I go into my oh, settings, and I had AG, AGC, and we said, okay. And I make others like this. Again, I didn't do the entire bottom track, but this is one at a time we would do it. Right click, make others like this. Um, check, careful, you don't want to check all this point, check just the sub bottom, but whatever's enabled inherits out there. Apply all settings and I'll say, okay. But one of the things about sub bottom is is the crossing lines, and that's really important. Um, it's you know it, it's a it's a check. And when you do, for instance, the single beam survey, you always have these crossing lines. And I, I was always told five percent of the data had to be crossing lines. So it's a it's a way of checking it. But in this case, it, it's a way of making sure that there's my sub bottom which pushed on its side. Well, because it's a check. Um, sub bottom, we'll put back navigation. These crossing lines are going to be really important. And in my processing, I want my intersections. Now, there's managers for everybody except for the intersections. There's a manager out there, but where is everybody? 
first time I saw it, it's like, how do you make intersections? Well, I'm going to have to compute. It doesn't really tell you that, hey, you want to have intersections, compute it first. And there's all my intersections. So if we take intersection number five, for instance, just a random number, and I right click, I can quick view 3D. Here's my crossing lines. And I want to make sure that the values are okay. Give it a second. And it's going to open up a window in, in 3D at the, at the machine, at the side. And what's happening here is, is the point that I wanted to bring up, that the, the bottoms don't line up. It's a towed system. And it went up and it went down. And even though we did the bottom track, yeah, things still didn't work. There's an alignment issue out there. So we have a neat little tool to do this data align to bathy grid. So assuming we have a bathy grid, I'm going to um, add in a grid. It's a bathy grid. It's a XYZ file that we made into a grid. There's my grid file. Okay, I cheated a little bit because how do we have this grid? As long as we have some kind of depth value. And if we look at my bathy and my I'll put it into 3D view to show you what it really looks like is there's my bathy grid. This is the image where we're going to have sub bottom below and side scan on top and do all the draping. So I'm just going to push this aside for a few seconds. So we noticed the side scan aside, the sub bottom wasn't aligned. We just we saw that with number five. Well, in this processing, we spent a lot of time in this processing tab, data aligned to bathy grid. What's the grid? Well, there's only one. If you had an, multiple ones, we could have another one. I'm going to check all the files and we'll say, okay. In about 10 seconds, I'm going to start aligning everything. Nothing changes on the screen, but if I go back to intersection number five and I do the quick view 3D, that where it was misaligned before, we're going to start seeing things will be a little bit you know, better. And I probably should have bottom tracked everybody a little bit better. Oh, there it is on the bottom over there. So the alignment is okay. One of the other things that I had, I just noticed there is, is, is we're seeing the water column. And for sub bottom, the important thing is from the surface below. We don't really care what happens in the water column. Fishery folks might want to. So one of the things we have to do in the sub bottom if I right click and I go into settings, is this blank, this water column? I forgot to do it before and I'm going to just say apply. And I'll do that for everybody. So what I'm really interested in is the, the seabed below. For the bathy, it's anything you know, at the surface and side scan is anything that, that's you know sticking off the bottom. So I'll do this. And then the next step would be the, you know, we align the bait data to bathy, so all the bathy is fine. I'm sorry, all the sub bottom is fine. Right click, make like others, same dialog box, apply all settings. Okay, give it a few seconds. So now we got all the data alignment, we removed the water column, we had a bottom track everyone, and I cheated a little bit, I didn't bottom track everyone, but I applied the gain to everybody, so at least we could see the data. I like, love to say that side scan and sub bottom, and it, it doesn't take a long time to process. It's a lot of repetitive set, steps that we do, and there's some batch steps that we can we can go ahead and handle, which is what I did. Um, so we have our sub bottom, and I'm going to select all the files. Oops, <laughs> have I just all the sub bottom files? And then the display, I'm going to pump it in 3D. I look at my data now, we could start to see my, my sub bottom is out there. Well, I had my side scan data from before, and it's a GeoTIFF image. We don't want to bring in raw side scan data here. We can, but yeah, we want to bring in a georeference image. I'm going to take this little button up there. I'm going to add in a right click, this add geo image. And it's in my C. Sonowitz project, co-locate, geotip. 
and there's my side scan data that I made before. But there's a problem here. Side scan is kind of floating in, in midair. We don't know where it is. Well, we do. And that's where if I go back to the grids, I'm going to drape that image on top of the bottom. Let's say OK. And now I can see everyone's nice and even. And if I take the vertical exaggeration off, that's where we started. We're saying, if we had bathy data, we can do a lot more with it. Because all of a sudden, the side scan actually has some kind of nice perspective. And if I go underneath, I get my sub bottom. That one little line, that's probably my left, right, or my scale bar that I said, when we make a GeoTIFF image, make sure we clear everything out. So there's my combining all this, these data sets in, into one. And it becomes a nice, you know, powerful tool because it's not just sub bottom. It's sub bottom. What's on above the sub bottom? What's what's peeking out above this? Well, it's a rock. Well, what does a little rock look like? Well, it's in the side scan. It, it has this perspective. So there's a lot of little steps that we have to worry about to get to this step. Um, but you do it enough times, it, it, it's 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 doable. It's, it's easy. When I started making my, my features and, and, and values, I had all my, my volumes and my intersections and my, and my features. I had my, my values in terms of uh, my thickness. But if I wanted to get this out, I can export out um, this, these values as an XYZ data set. You can't do any plotting, but you can say XY the volume. So we have that value out. Um, in, in the processing, we have our, our, we did the intersections, we did the data alignment. Inside sub bottom, we can do cores, we can block, block it in. So notice we have the sub bottom with the cores. We're not going to do cores for side scan. Digitized feature goes for everybody, contacts go for everyone. Inside, let me go back to my random file. If I wanted to make a contact, under my contact, I can say new contact right out there, and there's my contact. So the contact is a, and the contact report that we saw previously will work with everything else. So that's contact 000. If I go to my contact, and there's my contact. But be careful. The only interesting thing here is, and, and you can do the length and width measurement, there is no shadow measurement, is when I start exporting out contact report generator. I don't know why we have a first page. You always hit next. I'm going to create a new report, sub bottom. And there's, there's more pages I can go through in terms of background and title page, which I skipped over. But we'll notice this one thing that it's upside down and, and there's an invert button. <laughs> there's my picture, it's upside down. So there's a lot of little things in here that say, well, it's upside down, we have to straighten it out. Um, I believe it's in the contact report generator. Invert. Thought I saw my invert. Flip. There we go. Why there's a flip in there and not by the default upside down, I don't know. But these are the things, now it's straightened out. These are the things when you go through Sonar Wiz, you'll learn. You make the mistake once, like, oops, I forgot how to do it, or oh, oh, it's upside down. How do I fix it? It's either in the in the in the context menu or in the global menu up up on top. What we're going to do after lunch, because we'll take a, a bit of a break, is we're going to go back to the, the barges um, and we're going to bring in the bathymetry. And then I'm going to do um, some other bathymetry, which is um, it's a multi beam system. This is an orbit system. And it's a half dozen lines that I have. And we're going to look at them and we'll do a patch test and a performance test. Um, so that's how I, I'm going to.
finish up. So we'll we'll take a lunch break. It's it's you know it's a few minutes early, but I think everyone's a little bit antsy because we've been talking for two and a half hours. We're gonna have Rich talk about the 6205, um, and then I'm gonna go through some bathy processing. Thank you. Okay, so hopefully you can all hear me. Uh, welcome back. We'll carry on uh, with the uh, workshop session. Uh, first of all, uh, yeah, a welcome and a thank you, of course, to uh, Chesapeake and to Sutter for hosting this. A few slides in the PowerPoint um, to discuss a little introduction, how to check the Bathy products, focusing on the 6205, but also the 2205, as a bathymetry from that product. Uh, how we do the bathymetry, so our hybrid bottom detect. Uh, a few slides about that. So uh, take a quick look at a couple of installation examples. So if you get a 6205, hooking it up, uh, what it is you see and what it is you need to do. A couple of tips, tips and tricks. Uh, we've made a few changes uh, late last year and uh, last summer, a new uh, version of the uh, sonar model. And then we'll wrap up and pass back to Harold for uh, the uh, sonar with demo with the Bathy data. So, uh, as explained earlier, the sonar products that we have, the sites can sub bottom was talked to earlier about by Nick. And so, if we're looking at the bathymetry uh, parts of our product range, it's, uh, for example, the 6205 that's highlighted there top. Um, hopefully, you can see the mouse as well. Um, that's a bathymetry and dual frequency side scan. Some of the toad systems we have, uh, combined sonars as we call them. So that's bathy side scan and sub bottom. Um, so the bathymetry element there, uh, a variety of frequencies available depending on which, um, which model you choose. And then for the uh, AUV, ROV typically uh, market, uh, we call this the 2205 product range. Um, and these also end up then sometimes on our custom engineered solutions. Um, which have been in social media recently. But uh, what I'm going to talk about in terms of the bathymetry aspect is common to all of these, uh, these product range, uh, these product uh, items, in that it's all the same MPES, as we call it, multi-phase uh, echo sounders. Um, and it's the common version of the Discover software that you'll use to, to operate that. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of the tips and tricks about the um, uh, settings to get the best out of the bathymetry are common to all of those systems. So, uh, although the, primarily I'll be talking about 6205, it applies to the other sonar models as well. So MPES multi-phase is what we talked about. In the case of the 6205, uh, dual frequency side scan and bathy simultaneously. So uh, it'll be uh, one ping ping on the low frequency side scan, the high frequency side scan, and then the Either of the frequencies will be the bathy frequency as well, and depending on which model you choose, depends uh, which is the bathy frequency. But if you switch on uh, both low frequency and high frequency, then yes, every time you ping, you'll get a low frequency side scan, high frequency side scan, and a bathy set of data as well. Um, we talk about a hybrid uh, bottom detect because our uh, bottom detect method it combines both phase discrimination uh, for the wide swath, but also some beamforming techniques, which is how we uh, close the nadir gap. Typically, phase differencing system or phase detect systems are uh, uh, associated with a nadir gap uh, in the in the BATI data. Um, but because of the technique that we use by uh, merging uh, both beamforming and phase discrimination techniques, then uh, we we have uh, no nadir gap. But also the wide swath, typically um, uh, used to being gotten from a dual head system. And uh, I'll explain a little bit later how this uh, our technique is still uh, meeting the uh, the popular standards that are around there for examining, uh, um, I, uh, uh, to, like the standards of the IHO uh, for probability point uncertainty. So I mentioned it just now, it's always Bathy and side scan. So Bathy, Bathy backscatter, um, the MPES bathymetry, but also the dual frequency side scan. Um, so there's a good example. And then shortly I'll explain which frequency options uh, are available. 
when talking about the dual frequency side scan, so low, low, uh, uh, low frequency and high frequency, one of the other things to bear in mind, and that was explained or discussed a little earlier by Nick, is that actually that you, there's potentially three outputs on the uh, on the side scan aspect. Not only the low frequency, the high frequency, but also motion tolerance. So we use a software technique to reduce some of the pitch or your uh, effects that you'll sometimes see on the side scan data. Um, on You've got the choice, you can have all three, low, high, and motion tolerant, or you can choose, depending on the, the software you're using for the post-processing, maybe you want to replace, for example, the low with the motion tolerant, so you still end up with two, um, but uh, you do have that choice. Frequencies for the 6205, then. Uh, frequencies available to date. There's the 230 kilohertz uh, low frequency with 550 kilohertz high frequency with the BASI on the 230 kilohertz or the low frequency. There's the flip of that, which is 550 and 230, but the BASI is on the 550 side of it. So you still get the two side scan frequencies, but the BASI is on the high frequency. I introduced about two years ago, I think it was with the 6205S, as it was called, was 55850, where the BASI is on the 550. And then for some very high detail work, high resolution work, there's the 550-1600 kilohertz uh, combination. So it's always a common uh, chassis. Uh, and then we change the transducers and some of the settings inside, depending on the frequency pairing. And if you're interested, this is what a sort of a cutout would look like of the sonar array. So you'll see the low frequency side scan. So this uh, set of um, Ceramics for the low frequency will be the uh, low frequency transmit and receive, true side scan, so full length uh, array. Alongside that, the high frequency part of it, depending on which frequency pair it is, depends on the, the final length. Uh, so that's high frequency transmit and receive for the side scan data. And then, it, for example, in the case of uh, 230 BATHY, if this was the 230 uh, side scan transmit, this would be the transmit for the side scan and the bathy, the transmit, and then here's the bathy receive elements at the back. So a slightly wider, more um, staves to the array for the bathy side of the receive. So simultaneous, uh, low frequency transmit and receive, high frequency transmit and receive, and then for the bathy would be uh, one or other of these transmitted pulses would then be received here. And then we do the bathy processing. So that's how we get, achieve Simultaneous yeah. dual frequency side scan and BATHY. There's a, there's a comment here about field exchangeable arrays. That applies to the 230 550 combination. You can have a set of arrays where the 230 kilohertz is the bathymetry. You could then field swap those for a different set of arrays and make it a 550 kilohertz BATHY system. It only applies to that uh, pairing at the moment. But it does uh, mean that you, uh, if you wanted to switch the BATHY frequency, that, that is an option. Some uh, numbers from the data sheet, uh, giving you the uh, along track and cross track beam widths, uh, recommended operating depths. So in the case of a 6205, you'll see uh, shortly it's um, intended for a surface mount, so a small launch or a larger USV, something like that. For uh, generally shallow waters, so 50 meters or less, typically it will go deeper. A 200 kilohertz system will, of course, measure a, a couple of hundred meters. So you'll get batty in deeper waters, but um, uh, the product is, of course, intended as a uh, to get the best out of the side scan. So it's not really uh, just an echo sounder for depth measurement, but of course uh, for for doing the um, location identification of uh, fine uh, small features on the seabed which is really where the, the benefit comes from, the uh, true side scan data. Always 800 depths uh, per ping, uh, an opening angle of 200 degrees. So um, uh, 400 depths to port, 400 depths to start, it gives you a total of 800 depths uh, in the swath. And then some guidelines on terms of, in terms of uh, ma maximum ranges or maximum depths and, and depth resolution. Uh, typically, we use FN signals, uh, frequency modulated signals. Uh, Nick explained that uh, nicely this morning. Uh, good uh, ping rate. Uh, the 6205 is uh, typically around the 48 volt input to um, because we have the, the ability for the longer decade between the top side 
the interface box and the sonar, the wet end system. The 22 out of 5 I mentioned uh, is a 24 volt, typically a 24 volt based uh, system. So more suitable for, uh, for the smaller USVs. Lower power consumption, uh, EdgeTech Discovery is the software that goes with it. The Discover Bathy is uh, the version that does both side scan and Bathy. Windows based, so you'll need um, some sort of a little Windows computer to run the uh, to run the Discover alongside and get some data. Discover looks something like this when it's in Bathy mode. So the dual frequency side scan, uh, high frequency, low frequency, and then there's a couple of displays for the Bathy data. Uh, a raw Bathy data process Bathy in a, in a pseudo 3D. Um, for example, a coverage plot for Bathy is pretty limited. And that's obviously where uh, packages like uh, Chesapeake fit in. So Chesapeake, um, some people think it's just for the post-processing, but uh, it's worth uh, reiterating that, of course, you can use Chesapeake to acquire the data as well. Here's a little example where a laptop was used with a monitor connected to it. And so then on the uh, the external monitor, we were running Discover. We moved Discover to the external monitor, turned it around. You get uh, in a sort of a, a vertical scheme, the uh, side scan data and the Bathy, disc, the Bathy data. And then on the laptop screen, we're running Chesapeake in real time. So using a, a sonar with server to collect the data from, um, from the 6205, in this case, in real time. And provide not only uh, a second version of the um, the side scan waterfall, but also uh, a, uh, a coverage map of the side scan and or the bathy, and a nice uh, 3D point cloud display from the bathy uh, as you're sailing along. So then uh, you see um, uh, in nice detail the uh, the the full do uh, sonar data set. Of course, you would use uh, the sonar whiz for line planning. Uh, helmsman displays, all those sort of extra displays that uh, that aren't really in the in the uh, Discover uh, Bathy version. But uh, that's uh, that's a, a very very uh, a very typical layout of um, of what might be used to actually acquire the data. So then you could store the data uh, if you were doing this. You'd be storing the data directly in the CSF uh, format that uh, Harold mentioned, and there wouldn't need to wouldn't be the need to post process import the JSF. Uh, into into sonar with you can, but uh, another way of running it is to is to run uh, sonar with in real time. So taking a little look uh, in some detail at the uh, bottom detection, majority of the swath, the wide swath phase differencing is is the technique that's used. Uh, if you have uh, a couple of staves in the array, you can look at the phase difference of the returning signal and then do a launch angle travel time estimation, and that gives you uh, the uh, the bottom detect location. Uh, the more staves that are available, the more robust, uh, because you have more phase differences to look at, the more robust the uh, depth detection will be. And uh, fairly unique uh, in the phase differencing systems is the edge tech. We use 10 staves in the receiver array, so uh, we consider it a very robust uh, bottom detect because we're looking at uh, more than just a couple of phase difference uh, pairings, but uh, up to nine uh, up to nine differences if we had the ten staves. So we're uh, we're nicely confident that the the depths that we report are are, are robust estimates of of depth. Phase differencing is not um, just in the phase differencing systems. Of course, multi-beam multi echo sounders use phase differencing for the outer, outer swath. There are slightly different math than what they call um, split beam processing, but uh, the, the net effect is phase differencing. So rather than using different staves, you know, vertically separated, they'll uh, use divide the uh, receiver array into sub apertures and do it that way. Um, uh, so any sort of uh, Mills cross type arrangement, transmit, receive uh, uh, pairing uh, can uh, achieve the phase differencing uh, technique. Um, most of the modern multi beams uh, do it slightly differently and use a time delay beam forming uh, for the phase differencing. But yes, it's a, it is a phase differencing technique um, alongside the amplitude detect that they also do for the, the near nadir uh, or a vertical. Uh, uh, keyword type stuff. 
But for the rest, uh, the, yeah, the wide swath stuff, it's also a phase differencing technique. Um, the reason I mention this is, um, uh, so there's, there is overlap in, in terms of uh, the way we work and, and the way the, the, uh, the multi-beam echo sounders work. So I mentioned that we use FM pulses. FM pulses is, is uh, good because it delivers the high signal to noise ratio, uh, which can impact the performance of some of the multi-beam. So, uh, just because it's a beam form, it doesn't necessarily mean to say that it's um, that much more robust uh, in terms of its signal processing. They also have um, have some uh, some issues with uh, with their with their uh, the robustness of their bottom detect. Um, and and uh, and as you can see here, they, it's quite well documented. Other phase differencing systems that are on the market uh, alongside the edge tech. Uh, in 6205, there's a couple still out there, um, uh, more or less popular. Um, the significant differences between the other systems that are out there and the edge tech system, uh, the dual frequency side scan is certainly one thing that's uh, uh, unique to edge tech. Uh, the other significant difference is because we do this hybrid beam uh, bottom detect with the um, Combining the beamforming technique and the phase differencing technique, um, we have no nadir gap. The other systems that are out there will have, to some extent, a nadir gap in the BATHY data. The other thing worth pointing out in terms of a difference is uh, the little picture of the 6205 you'll see here on this uh, USV. This is the 6205 that's been extended with the sun bottom um, uh, sensors. So at the front, uh, attached to the nose cone of the 6205. You can see the uh, sub bottom transmit unit and difficult to see, but it is there off the back of the 6205 is the, is a small PVDF panel, which is the sub bottom receive panel. So that's another feature that makes uh, um, a benefit to using the edge tech version of the phase differencing uh, uh, sonar system. Looking just at the BASI, uh, on the left there, we get the full uh, coverage across the swath. Uh, shown here, uh, as opposed to ha having the nadir gap. So not only a, a gap uh, in the standard side scan uh, data, but also then a nadir gap in the BATI to some extent. Uh, different systems uh, have the varying extents of the gap at nadir, but um, thanks to the beamforming technique that we use, we we no, we don't have a, a nadir gap. So uh, a nice robust data set. If you purchase a 6205, uh, what's the minimum uh, that will be delivered? Of course, the sonar head. The back cable, uh, the sonar head includes the sound velocity sensor, so we get the sound velocity at the surface or at the sonar head, the shipping case, uh, and some form of top unit. So shown here is the rack mount version of the top unit. There's also, um, you'll see that in a second, a portable a splash proof for top unit. And a little spares kit. Uh, for example, I mentioned you can swap the arrays if you have a field exchangeable array kit. Uh, so then there's the spares for uh, for looking at that. Or if you wanted to clean the sound velocity kit, we provide the tools just to take the fairing off. The yellow is just a simple hydrodynamic fairing. Doesn't add anything to the structural in the strength integrity of the unit. And you can see there on the top a uh, stainless steel uh, plate that forms the the, the backbone of uh, the mounting arrangement. Uh, options. Uh, we can supply you with a typically with a rugged laptop for running a edge tech discover. Uh, if you uh, because it's a BATI sensor, of course, you'll need to consider um, position, motion, and heading, as well as an SVP. And so those are other other uh, sensors that we can provide as well uh, if we were to quote you for a system. Um, just to give you an idea that. Portable top unit looks something like this. So there's the portable uh, together with the laptop. Another option that we can provide is an adapter plate. Uh, this fits um, the most popular of the sort of multi beam type uh, pole arrangements or flange arrangements. And so uh, that's a little option that you can get. And then in the left here, you can see uh, this is what would be supplied if we uh, if we were to uh, if you were to buy the field exchangeable. So a complete sonar head with, for example, 230. Uh, 550 um, array, and then uh, you'd swap that uh, using the, the toolkit provided and the instructions. 
you could swap that in the field for a 230 550 where the for example the bat is on the 550 frequency instead of uh, the arrays that are in there that are on the uh, 230 frequency moving on to interfacing the equipment um Matthew data requires uh, good time synchronization, uh, more so than uh, than sides can. So the, probably the first thing you'll hook up is the PPS, uh, a GTL pulse, uh, and a, some sort of a time sync message, ZDA, GGA, something along, along those lines. In this case, although the picture shows a pulse MV, um, uh, in this case, we're discussing using the COM ports. There's uh, a couple of high-performance COM ports uh, on a portable or a rack mount, it doesn't matter. Uh, to interface the data, so for example, you could have uh, position and heading, NMEA, GGA, HDT coming over one com, com port and something like a TSS motion sensor message uh, coming over the other COM port. It doesn't have to be in the Planix, uh, one of the other inertials will do. Uh, or if you have a standalone GPS, a standalone gyro and a standalone motion, interface that. the sonar's interface via the deck lead. Uh, this is uh, the power supply and the, uh, the uh, data interface. And then using a network interface, uh, you'd hook up your laptop or survey computer running Discover and maybe um, uh, SonarWiz. And then uh, you can choose whether you interface your peripherals directly to them or you use this as a little uh, local hub and then get the data just uh, through one uh, common data connection. But certainly the sonar data, data will come. And because you've uh, input the time tag, then all the sonar data is nicely uh, UTC time tag time in message for, uh, for the uh, data acquisition or the uh, what's stored in the JSF file. Optionally, instead of a serial interface, you can use a network interface. Uh, and optionally shown here would be a sub CIMU. Uh, that was one of the changes between the 6205 and the 6205S, was that we put a whole pattern on top of the sonar, so you could fix the I sub CIMU uh, to the top of the sonar. Uh, so um, eliminating or trying to minimize any misalignment angles between the uh, between the inertial system and the sonar reference frame. Using the network interface, then you could maybe, uh, in the case of the Aplanix, get the message 102. That's everything you need for timing, navigation, heading, and motion. A uh, network interface to the top unit using the network hub. That's inside our top unit. Um, it's passed uh, in the wet end and then uh, passed on to uh, to your uh, Discover Sonar Wiz type uh, computer. Typical of uh, many systems that are out there. Looking a little bit in detail, uh, what happens uh, in terms of data arriving and time tagging? So here's your motion position time tag data coming in, goes to the top unit, whether it's the portable or the rack mount. Uh, and from there, it's passed by the deck lead down to the wet end. It's down in the wet end that all the uh, unpacking of this data takes place um, using the time in message if it's available. Um, and then together with the sonar data, that's passed back up through the top unit to the uh, computer that's running uh, Discover. In the case of Discover for Bathy, uh, not only is there the side scan interface, but the Bathy interface. And what's happening is in the background, we have a second uh, process running. Uh, called Bathy, the Bathy processor, and that's where the bottom detect is done. And uh, you can change the settings for the bottom detect in uh, in uh, in the Discover program. So it's actually from the top unit you're getting the bottom detect data, and that's what's passed uh, all the uh, position and orientation data plus the side scan plus the Bathy data would be what's output to the to the survey computer. Uh, in this case, running uh, sonar with, for example. Uh, you'll also see here uh, the little SV unit. So that's the surface SV unit that's on, uh, uh, on the bulkhead in the, on the electronics bottle. That uh, surface SV value is also passed top side. But uh, if you had an SVP unit uh, for your profile, then of course you'd be applying that in your third party software or offline in post processing. Uh, Chesapeake, uh, I mentioned they do the data acquisition, but also the post-processing. Harold's shown a couple of examples of importing the JSF files in a post-processing sense, but it can also capture the data in real time. There's other software that can capture the data in real time, and there's other software that can post-process the JSF. So there's plenty of options available to you. 
some examples here of installations. Um, small launches, typically, for uh, the shallower water work, uh, inland rivers, lakes, ports and harbors, coastal work, the very typical uh, domain that you'll find uh, the 6205 type product. Some uh, are bow mounted with a deployable system like here, a couple of over the side examples, um, so long as you've got uh, the, the correct power supply. Uh, here's one that uh, pops down instead of popping over the bow, it pops over the stern uh, in between the outboard engines, as long as it's uh, forward enough so that the transmitted receive pulses aren't interfered with um, under normal motion, forward motion, then that's uh, also an option to you. And then a couple of USV examples, uh, this one we've seen. This is actually another example with the sub-bottom, and in this case, uh, the uh, sub-bottom transmit unit wasn't uh, attached to the front or the back of the 6205, but it was actually inside the hull. It was transmitting through the, the fiberglass hull. And then the, we hid the, the um, sub-bottom receive unit underneath the 6205. We fitted it to the bottom. But all the electronics are uh, self-contained in the 6205 housing. And that's still the case. So that's a couple of options for you. Uh, I mentioned the 2205, uh, typically delivered in an OEM form factor, so the electronics and the array, and then uh, fitted to a vehicle rather than coming in a sort of a ready, ready to go sonar frame. Uh, some examples of 2205s where 2205 has been used uh, to deliver dual frequency side scan and also the battery data. Um, uh, in uh, in various guises. Uh, we mentioned a couple of the frequencies that are typically available. Uh, maybe you saw on our social media posts uh, last summer, we also completed the work on um, 5, uh, 520, 850 or 850, 1600 kilohertz. Uh, the thing there being that the bat is on the 850 kilohertz. So even higher frequency, shorter range, but even uh, the potential for more resolution. Uh, better, finer resolution bathy, uh, and of course a very nice um, uh, choice of uh, side scan pairs. For the 2205, that's definitely an option. For the 6205, it's uh, we've done it in a test form, but uh, for the 2205, that's um, that's definitely an uh, an array set that we could uh, we could deliver. So particularly for these uh, smaller USVs, that uh, that's a very attractive proposition for uh, inshore work. If you follow the social media, you might have seen in the last couple of days uh, an update by Sea Robotics. Um, it was, uh, sorry for going backwards and forwards, this vehicle, the SR Surveyor vehicle. Um, it, had the, it has the 2205 nicely integrated. Originally, it's the, the 2205's array, arrays are here, port and starboard, one in each hull with the electronics inside. Uh, they've got a customer now that's requested the uh, sub bottom aspect to it as well. And uh, this is the nice fairing they've built for the. Uh, sub bottom transmitter and then sub bottom receivers in the back here. So this is uh, just completed its sea trials. Here's some of the data from uh, from the uh, little lake, the test lake that the Sea Robotics have out the back of their factory. And so that's uh, another option that's available to you, uh, the, the 2205 with the sub bottom. It's a bathy system. It's a dual head bathy system. So uh, if you don't patch test it like you would uh, another wide swath system you might end up with artifacts uh, looking something like that but uh, usually very easily fixed with, uh, with uh, completing a patch test i think harold's going to discuss that in a minute he mentioned he's got a data set uh, to show that to you standard uh, dual head uh, pretty much um, in terms of the line pattern that you need to acquire for being able to solve the roll uh, for the port side the roll for the starboard side uh, and then we consider that uh, you can uh, state it that pitch and your will be uh, as if you were solving a single head. Um, so you can solve one and the same value for the pitch and the your values that you would apply in sonar with for the other software. But roll, you should do, uh, you should treat it as a, as a dual. So that impacts slightly the line pattern that you sail uh, in terms of uh, forwards and backwards, uh, depending on which head is overlapping. Uh, not too difficult, and uh, nothing more complicated than, a, than another dual head system. Um, and uh, just uh, be a little bit careful uh, when it comes to post-processing. If you were to post-process your and pitch uh, as individuals on each head, then of course uh, you should be looking to achieve uh, very close values um, 
for, for those two in particular, although they might be slightly different, but if they're way different, then that says something about the lines and the piece of, piece of line that you've chosen to do. That. So if you've uh, integrated it, you've got the uh, nicely time text serial data or a motion uh, peripheral data coming in, uh, then you should end up with uh, some, some nice uh, batty data and, of course, the dual frequency side scan. A couple of examples from, uh, from very typical projects. Uh, wide swath, so eight, often eight times water depth quite happily, depending on uh, if it's uh, like a river there with the, with the, the channel banks uh, sloping up, then of course you'll pick that up quite nicely. It'll be the full wide swath uh, result. Tips and tricks for you, some uh, recent improvements. Uh, a little bit earlier, Harold was talking about importing the um, JSFs into SonarWiz. Uh, he did mention um, with the side scan data that he was looking at, uh, using course made good, and there's that uh, 300 pings uh, set, setting for um, smoothing the course made good. Of course, in the case of a 6205 or a 2205, where you've got something like a POSMV interface, you've got a very accurate heading. So be sure when you come to you process the uh, side scan part of the side scan BATI data set that you, um, in the properties of the side scan files, you switch to using sensor heading for the heading source and not course made good. Because then the targets that you have uh, will perfectly align in the, between the side scan and the BATI data. And then Harold mentioned also about the um, uh, be a little bit careful if you have a, um, a, a project setup where you have a separate GPS and a separate motion sensor, so they're physically uh, located somewhere different on the boat to the sonar. Uh, when you import the BATI, that's taken care of. Uh, but if you import the side scan, you might have to compensate for the um, uh, the navigation offset. Um, it's only the GPS that's uh, location that would be of significance there. Uh, you have to correct for that. Otherwise, again, the target that you see in the side scan wouldn't uh, nicely co-locate with the same target that you see in the battery. So um, just a little thing to be uh, slightly aware of there. Um, data outputs for the battery. Um, there's two. Uh, there's equal distance uh, binning mode. So um, the binned battery data set that's output to uh, the sonar with or that's stored in the binned JSF. Or equiangle, uh, equidistant is the one we recommend for the majority of use. Uh, so generally flat seabeds, that's kind of that sort of thing. Uh, in harbors generally, except for the key walls. If you're going to do some key wall work, vertical structures, that we recommend you switch to the equiangle mode. Maybe use some of the tools for uh, for blocking the side that's not uh, facing uh, the, the key wall. Um, because you're only really interested in that side of the data. But yeah, equiangle mode, if it's uh, key walls, other man-made structures, that sort of thing, maybe some fine detail over a shipwreck. Um, but otherwise, generally, the equidistant mode. And then uh, based on the water depth, typically, the typical survey water depth, you uh, adjust the um, either the binning size in meters for the distance binning or the binning angle in degrees for the equiangle mode. That's something you have control over. Um, except if you're logging, if you're using Discover to also log the JSF files. So uh, it needs a little bit of thought when you're um, when you're sort of getting ready for your survey. Take a, a look at the water depth, decide um, what bidding distance will give you sensible coverage, uh, knowing that you've got 800 depths to distribute over that uh, swath width. Um, the good news is. Um, Soon to be released, uh, we've finished the testing of a new mode, which is auto distance binning. And so then if you uh, choose to use this, uh, based on the nadir depth and the sonar range, the program uh, Discover Bathy will auto adjust the distance binning. So if you start off in deep water where you'd want a slightly larger um, uh, sounding interval, as you go into shallow water, the nadir depth will, of course, get less, and so the binning distance will get less. It's uh, also hooked up to the not just the sonar range, uh, but also this uh, limiting the swath width in, for the bathy as a function of the water depth. So if you're doing a, a survey where something like the IHO order is uh, of significance, you might want to say, well, I'm only going to collect uh, 
uh, bathy data eight or nine times water depth. And then the same thing, knowing uh, knowing the nadir depth, which is the water depth, so you can say uh, eight or nine times that, for example. And then it'll auto adjust the, uh, the uh, binning distance accordingly. So you shouldn't have to keep uh, tweaking the settings to get the best out of the bathy, the finest resolution out of the bathy data. Um, I, I mentioned it's going to be released soon. We're working on some other things in Discover, but when that's uh, done, then there should see uh, you, th you should see an update that's uh, available for download from our website. What does that mean? Here's a little example for you. Um, uh, the sonar was running uh, on the bathy frequency of 50 meter sonar range. Uh, 50 divided by 800 depths would give you something like 12 centimeters would be the recommended binning distance. If you use the smaller number, you wouldn't get the full width. If you use the larger number, you're actually um, wasting uh, uh, potential depths that you could, could have uh, uh, too large a spacing. So 13, uh, 13 meters water depth at eight times would give you a, a very similar number um, to get full swath and the best resolution. But you can see it shoals here. And it ends up in something like three meters water depth. Well, if you were making use of that uh, eight times water depth gating, then instead of having 13 centimeters as your uh, depth spacing across track, you'd end up with three centimeters across track. So the, potentially these uh, smaller features uh, would uh, would um, be represented uh, much better, much more accurately in the BATI data as well, instead of distributing um, or using a 13 centimeter a bidding distance uh, for a wider swath that's potentially not uh, IHO accurate. Plotting that out in a point cloud and in a plan view, you actually we sailed the, the line is up here of this uh, from this deep water to this shallow. Uh, if it was on a fixed down interval, you would have this. Yes, you'd have a nice wide swath, but uh, you have um, 50, meter, 50 centimeter um, spacing, for example, in this, in this case here. If you make use of the new feature, you can see as it gets shallower, so we uh, squash down the, uh, the, the sounding spacing. So uh, here is 13 centimeters and here it's only three centimeters. To make sure you get the best of the data. Um, these differencing systems in the past have had uh, some bad press. People look at the raw display um, and say, wow, that's noisy. Uh, not true. Uh, well, not entirely true because really what you should be looking at anyway is the bin data display. Um, um, but it's important in Discover, you've got control over that. Um, so a couple of the settings that you can change that will influence this without influencing, influencing the bin distance, uh, the bin data result uh, too much, are uh, some of the filters. Uh, you, the defaults work great, but uh, if you, uh, depending on the project, you might uh, wish to change them. Uh, and then if you go into the engineering parameters, um, there's uh, two values that uh, particularly influence uh, how this raw display looks versus the, uh, the, um, the process to bin the data display. The first one is the suppression level. So if you're in equidistant mode, it's automatically set to three. If you're in equi-angle mode, it's automatically set to one. If you're pushing the swath, so you're trying to get uh, as wide a swath as possible in terms of bathy, uh, not the side scan range, which would be fairly easy to set. Uh, if you're pushing the limits on the, on the bathy swath that you're trying to achieve, there's another mode here, which is mode five, which uh, does some further suppression, noise suppression, particularly on the outer beams. So that would quieten down this display. If, uh, if you're getting comments that uh, this seems unstable and noisy, it's actually not the case. There's something you can do about it. And the other parameter you can change is the maximum cross track. That's another uh, noise suppression filter. Uh, in this case here, to make it look this noisy, I've deliberately set uh, switched off the maximum the uh, cross track uh, uh, suppression. Um, whereas if you switch that on a little bit, uh, you'll end up with something like this. It's essentially the same raw data, but I've um, flipped the uh, uh, easily identifiable noise, uh, and it doesn't have too much of an impact on the on the bin result. If you take that to extremes where you push the uh, cross track suppression to a very high level, be careful because then you will uh, impact the, uh, you'll, you'll effectively smooth out the seabed. Depending on the project, it might be something you're looking to achieve. But if you're, for example, like you've seen in here, there's the odd rock or the odd boulder in the data set that you might be uh, particularly keen to make sure you've got the shoulders point on that, then be careful not to push the uh, cross track. Uh, uh, suppression uh, too much. 
uh, rule of thumb, uh, keep the uh, across track uh, value very similar to your uh, binning distance size and you can't go far wrong. Another way of pushing uh, the uh, the envelope, if you like, for the BATI data is to uh, particularly to play with the signal to noise and the quality filters that you ha you have full control over. Defaults are a little bit uh, pessimistic to uh, to make the BATI data robust. Uh, you can of course reduce that a little bit more of the weaker out of beam signals uh, into the BATI processing, uh, and then uh, the more raw soundings go into the the uh, binning process uh, than the chances are the more robust the uh, the outer beams are. Uh, you don't have to. It's uh, it's something you might like to play with if you're interested in uh, in uh, getting um, the most efficient swath uh, in terms of coverage and so time on the water. So there you go. A couple of tips. If you have an over the side mount, be very careful of this uh, or be aware of this uh, blanking range setting that we offer. Uh, it'll help reduce or minimize eliminate uh whole uh, whole reflections especially on an over the side and over the bow or over the stern it won't typically uh suffer from that it Im impacts um the navy detect that we do and that's also in the popular uh, populated in the gsf that's passed to chesapeake for example that appears in the side scan as the bottom detect so if you are over the side uh, you've got a very strong hull return make sure you set the uh, blanking range to uh, to blank that out so long as it's not that large that it then appears, uh, it impacts the rest of the data. Uh, my, uh, my suggestion would be, uh, yep, if it's an IHO type survey or a hydrographic navigation purpose uh, type survey you're doing, then uh, yep, consider using, uh, limiting it, limiting the swath as a function of water depth. Eight or nine times is typically very achieve, achievable. And then I met, just mentioned, uh, if I was to tweak any of the settings here to, uh, to try and get more out of the outer beams, then I would uh, be playing with the signal to noise and the um, and the quality filter. Just going back to this uh, raw display, you've got this uh, view menu uh, item here. Yeah, you can color code this display by the different filters. So if you want to see what the effect a particular filter is having in terms of rejecting some of the data or flipping some of the data, just go to the view menu and choose, so for example. Uh, the quality filter and then you'll see it'll color code the um, soundings that are being rejected or clipped by that filter they'll be color coded differently so that'll help you uh, decide whether you're uh, being uh, productive uh, in terms of tweaking the settings or, or whether you're actually making things worse uh, nearly time so there we go a quick summary uh, we talked about um, the 6205 and the difference in 6205 and the 2205 uh, some discussion about our bottom detect, few installation examples, and then some tips and tricks. So um, the chat is open, or um, uh, feel free to, uh, to contact us um, directly, either Nick or myself, or, or the uh, info page on the website. Uh, if you've got any questions, if you have a sonar and you um, you'd like some advice on, the, on on how it's being operated, or you're interested in uh, receiving some more information about the sonars, then. Uh, please feel free to reach out to us, uh, either the website or the social media channels. Uh, and of course, if you've got some uh, some nice stories, we're always uh, keen to hear about those. So thanks for your time. Keep well and uh, stay safe. Thank you, Richard. Um, should be able to grab the screen. Hey, when I'm in presenter mode, I can steal anybody's screen. So anyway, yeah, thank you for that presentation. It's interesting. I actually learned a few few things, and I, I like the the new feature coming out. Um, the other part that I picked up on it was the you know the, the density of the data, three centimeter spacing. I mean, at some point we're gonna be able to map every grain of sand on the bottom. But um, years ago it was a two meter grid binning, and then it became one meter, then a half meter, and then I'll show with this data set on the screen, we'll do 25 centimeters. And then you know, these systems are just getting better and better. So I wanna go through the bathymetry. I have two different data sets. I have a multi-beam and I have the 6205. Um, we started with the 6205 earlier. We made the, the side scan image. So I was gonna bring in the bathymetry. Let me remove the bathymetry so we can, you know, remove. 
So there was a side scan file. Um, and I said I only brought in one because it was a position shift. So I didn't want to bring in all the side scan. But for the bathymetry, I'm going to bring in all four files and show one, how we can adjust all the offsets and, and how it becomes critical. I mean, not just timing becomes important for bathymetry, but so does offsets. You know, the, the, the story with side scan is you throw it over the side or you tow it over the side. Half the time, you don't really know the position of the side scan. It's close, but you're not concerned about the, the few centimeter physical mount. But when we take a 6205 and attach it to the boat or take a multi-beam and attach it to the boat, that becomes more important. Um, when it's on a boat, you don't use course made good, you use sensor heading. So there's a little bit of you know, a difference. I mean, the, the sonar whiz buttons, you know, appear the same, but we just have to think a little bit differently because of a, of a multi-beam. I, I interchange the, the 6205 calling it a multi-beam as opposed to a phased attack, but it's bathymetry. Um, it's not really a multi-beam, but sometimes I slip and I say it's a multi-beam, but it, let's just say it's bathymetry. So on the import, in this case, I'm importing multi-beam. Um, desktop. Mm -hmm. So there's there's four JSF files. Again, what do we look at in the file specific? This this will change a little bit because it's from side scan. But sometimes the program is cheated and said we'll just use the same dialog box regardless. Sure. Um, XTF. This definitely changed because it has the amplitude data, so it's the the bathy and the side scan would look different. So on the on the JSF, you know. We'll take a look at it. Um, we added octans heading sensor. If there's no octans heading sensor, it, it's meaningless whether it's checked or not. Um, different values that we can look at. Well, let's just go with the ones that we have right now. And I'll bring in the four files. Um, not very big files, so it, it does go pretty fairly quickly. Um, the dots on the screen, I said, let me take off the side scan so we can just purely see side scan. This is individual data. But the dots are pretty big. Well, sometimes we use the same dialog box a few times under the view, under the drawing mode, under bathymetry, draw bathymetry, plot thickness. Well, it's navigation line thickness or sounding thickness. If I zoom in just in that top corner, you can see that these are just individual soundings that we're going to be looking at. So this is the raw data coming in. One of the things different uh, from side scan is side scan, I said there was a layback and a sheave issue down here. There was this layback and sheave for offsets out, out there. But for bathymetry, we don't have that here. What we do is in data acquisition, and I know we didn't collect the data, but it's stuck in data acquisition, is this vessel editor. Um, once you learn the, the menu items, you know where to go. So we're processing, but we're in the data acquisition to get to vessel editor. Now, I just brought the data in. And one of the things that you might quickly point out is it's 180 degrees. Well, it's the way that we use our sign convention. Um, it's just the left-hand rule. It comes in automatically at 180. You don't have to worry about it. In fact, if you put in zero to uncorrect it, the data just, you know, the one side wouldn't look good. Channel zero, one, it's, it's two channels. It's port and starboard. They don't start at one, they start at zero, so port and starboard. Um, but we have this X, Y, and Z offset. And I know what the values are. I, I kind of looked at up them, and it's the, the value is minus 1.79, and the Y was minus 1.58. The heads are slightly offset a little bit, so minus 1.5. Five nine and minus 1.58. I'm not worried about the Z value right now. I'm not doing tides. Um, it's funny though, in, in, in Chesapeake, this is in my value. There's no save button here. Well, you can change the color, but all I'm going to do is exit out. What happens is those green lights that were green before now become orange. It's because something changed and we have to merge the data. I can simply go right click and merge or in the bathymetry merge up there. 
Um, if I know what, if it's only the, those offsets, I can finish. If I look at my next, I can do internal, external attitude. If I was using uh, a Planix pause path, um, next, next. If I wanted to do um, angle filters, inner angle, outer angle filters, range filters, um, depth filters, they're all in here, frequency filter out there. All I did was I merged in the that XYZ offset. And it becomes that offset that we saw before, you know, cleaned up. So there's what we have to worry about is, is the, the bath, the offsets. And, you know, if we're collecting the data, we make a vessel editor. If it's, we're reading someone else's file, maybe some of the offsets come in, depends if that JSF was populated. If not, we're going to have to put it in. So always check it out. What we're seeing here is, you know, there's a little bit of a of, a, of an offset there. Well, well, we'll see what it looks like. If we want to get a quick value, again, that, that should support a line. If we wanted to get a quick, what kind of value or offset are we looking at? We have this cross-section tool. And I left click and drag, and I see my cross-section tool. One of the things we see here is there's a tremendous amount of overlap. I mean, this was a, you know, a survey area that, do we need this much data? No, we probably don't. But it's good to do a patch test and a roll test to, to use all this data. Um, but one of the things we have to do is, you know, we have to get rid of the flyers. There's probably some flyers out there. Um, there there's two ways to do it in this SWAT editor and area editor. Well, why is SWAT editor not available? Well, even though the file is enabled, once I select it, <laughs> then it becomes available. That's the way I learned how to do it. Um, so all four files are enabled. It's bringing up this Bathy Swath editor that has all the four lines in it. And you'll go one line at a time. And there's my data. So there's my four lines out there. What do we see here? We see top-down view. We, we see a profile view. We can get a 3D view if we want. Um, little green line is the direction of the boat. And any of these windows, we can do any edi editing. But before we go into the editor, we might want to change the pixel size, and eh, maybe two. Um, the number of sweeps, you can expand it and contract it. Um, it has 250, but what happens if I don't want to do the number of sweeps, I want to go the distance. If I do application settings, I can do a, um, a long track distance. So instead of 200 sweeps, I can do 129 meters, or I can do, uh, silly, 14 meters across. We always think about number of sweeps, but if you wanted to go in terms of distance, I want to look every 26 meters and, and filter it that way. doesn't really matter. <coughs> Excuse me. So we have good data points, bad data points. Um, it's, it's, you know, everything is, you become good at it. In side scan, we measure target heights with the shadow. It's subjective. Here is, is this point valid or not? Well, I learned, let me make it a little bit bigger so we can see it, undo. It's not connected to anyone. It's out there. So you're making a, a sub uh, uh, a, a judgment call. Um, we, know, we know that some of the, as we get further out on the swath, you know, there's a bit more noise. You know, we look at just, a few of the pings, we can see that it, it does widen out a little bit. So maybe we want to bring in a filter right off the bat. Or maybe we'll just keep everything and then and see what happens with it. So to, you know, we'll we'll get a little bit more data in so we can go through it a little bit quicker. We can in this auto reject on and a lasso on, I can left click and just lasso around. And it automatically deletes and automatically rescales it. So the minimum value gets the top. So in, in case of the bottom, I'm going to get rid of these two bottom points. Everything scales down. So I'll just scroll through it, value that like that. If I'm comfortable with it, I'll use the space bar and go down a little bit more. Now that's a barge. I mean, here's the question. I'm editing the data. Looks Does it look real or not? Well, I know that there's a barge out there. And I know that there's something out there in this, in this 2D, 2D view. So I'll just start cleaning it up a little bit more. And just for the sake of expediency, I'm just going to quickly process them quickly. Now, there's the barge up on top. If I make a mistake, I could always undo it. Oh. Okay. 
And we'll do the group. And, and that's the end of the first line. And we, we do this for all the data sets. What about if we wanted to go a little bit quicker or, or, or a few filters? What happens if we wanted to say anything above six and a half meters it is rejected? Well, I can try to draw a line across there, but in this min-max filter, I can say, well, anything less than, oop, do it this way, 6.5 meters, I want to reject. Or anything greater than seven meters, I want to reject, and I can clear it up that way. I mean, that's a pure, you know, min-max depth filter. I have a polyline filter where I can oop, clip it this way, anything above and below it. Because of the swath editor and the merge it's kind of different. If I wanted to do an angle filter, I could have done it before I even jumped into this, this bathy editing. In that merge, I could have said anything less than 75 degrees, clip out. Again, there's no save button here, so I'm in here. I'm gonna go back to the merge. Everything is green, but I'm still gonna hit merge. And I'll select all the lines and I'll go next to next to next. And eventually you'll, you'll figure out where everything is. I wanna do not a range filter, but an angle filter. The angle filter is out here, but up on top it says, do you want to enable it? Well, yes. I have to hit yes twice. I don't want to do an inner gap filter, but I want to do the outer beam. And I'll do 75, I'll do 70 degrees. We have enough overlap. And I'll say finish. And all of a sudden we're going to start shrinking it down. So I could do that prior to getting even into the swath editor. I'm probably clipped off a lot of a little bit too much data, but that's fine. Um, okay, so we 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 went through. I, I didn't do all four lines. I just did that one line. But we go through all the lines. We notice that there's a little blue dot out there. Something's happening out there that we didn't catch. Well, probably because I didn't edit it. But maybe this edge of this 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 the bulge that we want to clear up a little bit. It's on this line and this line. It's on two different lines. Well, how do I show them both? This is where the area editor is nice. I'm going to select a polygon. And I'm going to left click and just make a polygon around anything I want. And I right click. Now I bring up an area based editing. So it's not a line by line, but it's multiple lines, whatever lines are in there. And I have a 2D view, a 3D view. It's coming on the other screen. I got to move it over. <laughs> Um, so I have a grid view, I have a 3D view, and I have a 2D view, and any of these are editable. So if I zoom in a little bit, and I'll say, well, and I'm, for a 3D view, we have to hit the shift key, and I'm going to shift and get rid of those points. In the 2D view, I'm going to just inside there. And in, in the grid editor, I could do the same thing. I can clear out values can edit the grid. The grid's not as important. That's just my view right now. It's this 3D view that's most important. And if we look at colors, I want to color not by elevation, but by survey line. And this is where you can really tell how important or how good you know, a multi-beam, sorry, a bathymetry system is. It's the repeatability of, of the data. You want to make sure that all the colors are lined up. If you see one flyer out there, that's a pretty good indication that that's a flyer. If you see three colors up there, maybe it's a telephone pole on the bottom and it's a real feature. Um, so you have the line by line and you have this, this SWAT editor, which is a area-based editor. So we bring this data file in and we look at the first line is up there and, and which is reds going this way. So we're driving to the west and reds going this way. So we're driving to the east. And we want to do a, a patch test. Uh, I might have a problem, but I might have clipped too much data. Yeah, I clipped off too much data. So we're just going to go back in. I need a little bit more data to do a, a, a nice patch test. Um, so instead of 70 degrees, we'll bring it out to 78 degrees. We'll expand it. Like OK, <laughs> needed a little bit more data. So now we want to do a patch test. 
So we want to take our first line and our last line, and we want to do the row. So in our processing bathymetry patch test, the program doesn't know what you're going to do. So I have to select row calibration, and I'm going to go across the data. We'll go this way for pitch. We'll go this way for row. And it's going to come in into this data set. I can look at my port data or my starboard data and automatically do a calibration. And it comes up with a best fit on the bottom with well done that is zero degrees. It, it calibrated really good. We also notice in this screen, we didn't edit everything, which was fine. We didn't on purpose. If I wanted to do a pitch, we'd go across. Now I can, everyone's enabled. I don't have to pick only a, a certain set of lines. But if I only wanted two lines, I could. So maybe I only wanted to have, okay, this line again, we want to go reciprocal. So this is going to the left, and this one's going to the right. So this will be a perfect pitch test. I'll do my pitch, left click and drag, and we're coming across. And again, I can change my increment value up to a tenth of a degree and automatic calibration. Be careful with pitch. If you don't have your offsets correct, you don't have your latency correct, pitch will come up with a value, but it would be an invalid number. So in like side scan, do the bottom track first. There's certain things you have to do first. For bathymetry, got to get the offsets in first. Got to get your sound velocity and tight. You want to make all your corrections before you do any of these patch tests. Now, do I have to clean up all those flyers? It's, it's computing. Do I have to clean up all the flyers? Not necessarily. You don't have to make a perfectly clean data set, but you have to at least have all the offsets in. I probably shouldn't have done a tenth of a degree because it's going to take a few seconds. Yeah. I'll slide it over there. It, it'll finish in a second. So we have all our data coming in. There's all my data. And the data itself is this JSF file. And before it said CSF file, well, it's really not a JSF file. Tools, open project. In my Bathy folder, we're now working in the Bathy folder, it's CDF files. So we took our JSF, made a CSF was compact sonar file, compact data file, whatever the D stands for. M is a CMF file for magnetometer. So really it should be B for, for, for bathymetry, but it is. It's a CDF file. And inside the CDF file, it's a you know, it's SQL database. Um, I have values I can do. I can split time, ping, channel. And this is new. I can split by channel. That if you wanted to you know, split all the port values and all the starboard values, you can. It was actually designed for single beam, a dual frequency single beam. But because this is two channels, it's one frequency and two channels, um, we can actually split it into two different channels. I can split the data with a mouse. Or if I built a feature around, I can say, just save all the data inside a feature. So there's a lot of tools within the bathymetry that, that you could do. When we process all this data, uh, this is just a remnant of, of, of some of my da data editing. One of the, we don't need our color, anymore. One of the really nice things is we, we have our data here and we edited it. We went through the patches. I want to see, I want to make a grid. I want to do contour. Well, right in this screen, we can. If I right click on grid, I'm going to create a new grid. And I'm going to push it the limit, 25 centimeters. And I'll say 25 centimeter grid. Different, there's depth and amplitude, magnetometer. It's what we just recently added. I'm going to do a mean and I'm just going to do a mean. This depth blend, this cube, there's all different values. Folks say, well, what about cube? Don't you have all these offsets? In cube, we have advanced settings, and this is where we come into all our cube values. So it, it's it's all built in. Um, I'm just going to do mean. <laughs> and You could do min max. You can do the difference between the two. In, in grid, you can say, what's the volume between the high and the low? Um, but I'll just do mean, and I'll say, okie dokie, it's building and it should be done. But where is it? Well, if I take this one off, there's my grid. 
well, it looks like Bathy, but I have a tool in my view button where I can start doing sun illumination right there. And, and there's my Bathy grid in the main program. I don't have to worry about it. Well, what happens if I want to do contours? Well, inside the grid, I can, in the grid itself, in the depth, I can contour the grid. Or there's a few little spaces out there. You know, this is cheating, but we don't want to cheat. But I want to interpolate the grid by one meter. So we're going to fill in these little, little holes. It's thinking. We can fill it in. Um, we really don't want to make up data, but if you really didn't want a hole in your data set and you um, interpolate grid, I'll make it to two, and that'll fill up that last little hole right there. Completely cheating, but we want to make a nice surface. There we go. What about contours? Well, in this grid, right click, contour grid. Boy, these offsets are really high. Um, I'll make 50 centimeter contours. I'll make DXF files. I probably should have done 50 centimeters. So we can do our elimination. These are all GeoTIFF images. So that save project to geo image where we did for the side scan, you could do the same for here. Um, once it's a geo image, you can export it out uh, to Google Earth. So I can take this data and make a KML file, KMV file, KML file, and, and bring it into Google Earth. Well, let's finish with the contours and see what it looks like. There's my contours. Could be a little bit better. Contours are uh, stuck up here as a DXF file. Just refresh the screen. Maybe I needed just somebody wanted the XYZ data sets. Under processing export, we have our Bathy exports. Okay, I can make into LAS files, save the grid as, save XYZ. I save the grid as, export the grid as a new grid file type. So I can save it as global mapper grid, XYZ. If I wanted to save the grid value, that 25 centimeter grid, here's my 25 centimeter grid. If I wanted to say just this one file, export, path the export, XYZ, use all enabled files. This is all the XYZ of that file itself. That's fine. And there's my XYZ. It's not too bad. There's my XYZ. So the idea that we can go from import the file, edit it, and get it out fairly quickly is, is something nice. So we can save the grid of data or raw data. And be careful when you save all raw data because it's, it's millions and millions of points. It's going to be a lot of points. Under the view, we're going to take out the scale. We're going to export this out as a GeoTIFF. So just like the side scan. And once you know how to do one of the, the functions, the other ones really carry along. Save project as geo image. Um, I'll just do one, and I'll make it 32-bit. And I'll save it <coughs> Excuse me, as a different file because I need that side scan for when we do the draping later on. So that. Open in Google Earth, this this Bathy browse to Sonar with projects. And now we, we've taken our, our Bathy data and brought it in into somewhere in Florida. And there's my bathy data. So basically, it's the in and out of, of really the out. Getting the data in is fine. What do we do with the data to, to give it to someone else? We, we started earlier with our side scan. And, and that peeling it back was, was nice. So I'm going to enable one of the files. And not the measure, not this. This swipe the control. 
and I can swipe it back and forth. I have in this in the view trans. I thought I had opacity. Oh, there's my opacity. I can do some transparency. So there's a lot of tools within SonarWiz that you could do once you get you know once you get through the data set. We're going to put this aside for a second. Um, and we're going to go back to the. We're going to a different data set to do a little bit more. I want to save this for the draping later on because now I have a side scan and a bath and that's more of the more of the export. But we're going to go into um, Portland data set. Now, how did I get to this data set? Well, into this view. Same as before, I created a new project. I'll call it Portland, UK. This is Portland, Oregon. Um, we did a, during the winter training, um, we did, couldn't do any boat demos, but we, we hooked up with, with a boat in Portland, did a live video stream. This was the data collected during the class, you know, in 20 minutes. And 20 minutes later, I was able to process it, come up with a patch test and a performance test. Um, because I started in the project, the, the latitude and longitude work fine, so that's fine. created the project. Right click. Now, one of the other things I told you we could do is desktop training data, UK class, Norbit. Grab the files, left click and drag. Now, this works fine if things are set up, but be careful with side scan. Is it high frequency or low frequency? Sub bottom is a channel one or two. You don't get those options. So once those options are set, this works fine. Um, so it's a drag and drop. I'm going to bring all the files in yeah, five lines. These weren't long. They were probably four or five minutes long um, in length. Um, and, and there's my raw data. Without doing any editing, without doing, and it's a clean data set, but without doing any editing, I wanted to see the data. Right click, create a new grid, 25 centimeters, 25 centimeters. It's building the grid, and we're done. And there's my data. So that's how quick we can go from importing a file to processing. This is actually a pretty good data set. It's like I said, it's not very big. It, it's 100 meters. Um, the lines were going left and right. How do we know the lines were going left and right? If we go back into the view under drawing mode, bathy navigation, there are my lines. Notice I have a crossing line. We're going to use that for our performance test. And I have reciprocal lines here. That's our patch test. It's a single head, so I didn't need all this, but I, I have my roll data somewhere out here it's, and my pitch data somewhere up there. Um, so I go into my bathymetry, patch test, roll calibration, drop it down. And I'm not showing the bathy, I'm just showing the track length, but that's what the bathy would look like. Automatic calibration. I guess I really should get the blue bar down there so we can see what's going on. If you only want two of the lines, or only wanted a small section, you don't have to draw the line completely across. Oh, almost done. And the value should be zero. But that's the, the values of all the other lines. So it's nice to show all the lines. But if you wanted to just bring in two of the lines, if I wanted to bring in red that way and red that way, I was looking at the red, so I needed the direction to switch. Row calibration, top to bottom. Start the calibration. It does go quicker. So you don't have to bring in all the data sets if you know which ones, but there's no limitation to the number of lines you have. It's still zero, zero, zero. What about the pitch? You know, pitch is always one of the harder ones. Roll is about 90% of your error. You know, everything else is a little bit. Um, but pitch, you need a feature or a slope. 
Well, the slope is, is an issue if you don't have good position because you're trying to match up a slope with really poor positioning. So it all goes back to positioning. If you don't have really good positioning, yeah, short of the rel test, these other tests may not work. So here's our pitch calibration. I'm going to go up the slope. And we're trying to look for any deviations there. Automatic calibration. The installation on board the boat was a fixed mount, and they pretty well had it tuned in. So I didn't expect too much, but at least we had the process going through. It's going to take a few seconds. I'm just going to slide that over there. That'll finish up soon. But I have this one line that goes up and down. Now, why did I go that direction? <clears throat> when we run a multi-beam or interferometry, any of these systems, these bathymetry systems, there's a lot of calibrations that go on. It's not just the physical offsets that you have to measure. It's not just the patch test that you have to, you know. But how good is the system? Yeah. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this one line up and down and compare it to the entire grid. If I look at view, three mode, bathymetry, I'm going to compare that beam and that beam one. I don't know which one. Beam one is um, one, two, three, four, five. Oh, one, two, three, four, five. All the beam ones compared to the grid. All the beams two. All the beams three. All and all 256 beams sum it up and come up with how good is the entire system, you know, from end to end. Typically, as you get further out on the in the edge, data gets bad. It doesn't matter which system you have. That's that's the typical system. So how do we do a performance test? We kind of built in all these tools so we don't have to worry about much. Oh, my patch test came back at zero. Well, we knew that. Um, so I had to come up with a grid. And I'm going to build a grid, everything except that one line. So let's let's start back up here. I'm going to build a grid of just that data. I can't compare a line to itself because that's that's not right. So I'm going to come up in here with a grid and create a new grid. I'm going to call it performance test, perform test grid. And we'll say OK. And there's my performance test average. And the reason it looks fuzzy is because I have everyone else turned on. And now I'm going to take this one line and I'm going to compare it to the grid. So I'm, a lot of the tools are built in. If I go into bathymetry and it says performance utility. Now, when I was in, backing up one, when I was in um, the, the, the SWAT editor or when I was in some of these other ones, these are, okay, for instance, if I was in grid and I wanted to make a new grid, and I would say performance test one, it would fail on me because nothing is enabled. <clears throat> It'll say nothing's enabled. But it's an active dialog box. I can turn one on and it would work fine. But in this case, we kind of cheated a little bit and said, no, you don't have an option. You have this turned on and you have this turned on. You can't change it. So I'm going to right click. I'm going to say, Um, top one. You have that one. You have the values you want turned on. Performance utility. It said use this line and use this grid. You don't have a choice. You can turn them on and off, but that's what it is. And I'll say okay. Yeah, of course, I get an error message. Great. Huh. It might work. Oh. This is what happens when we're using the latest software. Um, well, never fail. We just. All right, well, we'll have to come back to my failure on that. But it comes up with a performance test that. We'll do this. Let me clear out some of these screens and get the performance test running with
Mm, no, I was going to use an older version of the software, but we're not going to. Uh, but it comes up with data that as you go from the port side to starboard side, you're going to get a range of, of the values that are good, plus or minus you know, standard deviation and two sigma level. So that'll give you the overall performance. On some systems, 60, 65 degrees, 70 degrees are good. On some systems, after 45 degrees, it degrades. Nothing to do specifically with the multi-beam or the bathymetry unit. It's a it's a unit, it's a um, system check. It's a performance check based on the system. Um, and that's that's always important to have. So when we have our, our, our data set here, uh, we'll take this one off. We'll go back into bathymetry. And I said, <laughs> you know, we, we need them enabled. We go to bathymetry and select on one. So even though they were enabled, I'm still going to hit SWAT editor. And to show the just the difference of, of a multi-beam versus interferometry on, on the, you know, the quality of, of some of the outer beams, um, it's still you still get flyers. Well, you're not going to do a whole lot of justice by looking at this big blob. It's just too many points. So I might have to scroll it down a little bit. And how far scrolling down do I go? Well, if we really want to go to the number of pings, let's go to pings. We probably want to do 100 pings. There's 38. You don't want to go too too little because it'll take you a long time. You don't want to go too far because you're not going to find anything. So there's a what's the best fit? There's no easy number, 50, 100, 200, depending what it is. There's a couple of points out there. I don't know what to do out there. I mean, it, it's not supposed to go down, so maybe I will remove it and I'll work my way up. Everything is still stuck down. Why? I have it on auto. Well, there's one bad point up there and then it readjusts the, the, the value of the height. What do you do with a point like that, that one little point? Well, if we look at the value, it's, it's 10.78 or something, and the next one over there would be 10.75. You know, in the scheme of things, things just might not matter. You don't wanna just leave a bad point in, but um, a, a little point like that, yeah, if you're gonna start collecting or deleting points individually, it's going to take a long time. That's where the SWAT editor, the, the area-based editor, works a lot better because she could see what the neighbors are doing. And scroll through. And a couple points down, down there. You can see that the progress bar is over there. Oh, there's a bad point there. So even on, on a good data set or a good system, there's going to be some flyers. We'll go through, we'll go through the next one, and we go through the same thing, same iteration. And it's important to view the data, at least in, in a general cursory look before you go into the SWAT editor. Um, because if I exit out of here and take this entire data set and go into my area-based editor, it would take a long time. So the area-based editor, maybe I just want to have a very inefficient middle box section. Building. So this is why, you know, I have a pretty good machine, um, but bathymetry takes up a lot more resources than the side scan. It's just drawing more points. So here's a case where general, I gotta make my point size a little bit bigger so I can see what I'm doing. You can see the flyers that I missed. And I can just go up in here, auto reject, lasso. Come on. Just trying to keep up with the, the drawing. There we go. So in this case, it, it is more efficient to, to bring everyone in and, and, and look at the data points. Um, but you still, if you started out in the, in the beam editor to begin with, you wouldn't have as much noise. There's, there's one bad point up there. I'm going to hold the cursor down and, and edit it out.
and there's more data points we can clean up as well. But that's that's our editing process. Processes. We come back in. We look. We look at it. That's the remnant of the SWOT editor. But the nice thing is, we can go quickly and, and go from from our word data to our edited data in, in our view. Now it looks pretty good. But how did I get to this view? Under the view, I, I turned on my sun illumination. I can change my illumination. Any I can make it really dark, really light, or a different angle. But if I don't want that, I can sim simply just turn it off, and it's a 2D flat view. If I zoom in, these are grid cells. If I zoom in here, these are point cells. The other thing we have, let me turn this off. We go back into our, our single line. And our display, I have this 3D editor, which is the same button. I just have to enable it. And I go into my 3D view, and I do some vertical exaggeration. You can see it in this 3D view. Well, we can do the sun illumination in the main shell, so you really don't need to do this. But this is where we're going to do more of the, the draping of the side scan. Well, this S7K has backscatter snippets, yeah, intensity. It has that extra value with it. And the reason I, I, I threw out all three terms is folks really into you know, confuse what they are. You know, you can say they're backscatter, and then as soon as I say backscatter, someone else says it's beam intensity or, or, or true picks, so that's a R2 sonic value. But I'm going to take that S7K value, and I'm going to import it. Even though I imported it up there, I'm going to import. I'll just do one. And file type specific, what's my by backscatter my, my value? Well, enable backscatter processing and see what happens. And I take off my FAPI, and there's my, my side scan. So we can see that these multi beam systems have this intensity backscatter. And once I have this intensity backscatter, or whatever we call it nowadays, um, bottom track as we did before. So side scan, right click, bottom track. Bottom track should be spot on, but once in a while it misses. So I'm going to remove the points. Sometimes it doesn't always work out perfectly. I can change the color. Remember how we did the color? Where's my color bar? It's out here, which is now on my other screen. I'll dock it there. So on my side scan, I don't want to have bronze. I want to have jet. Oh, that's a really bad color. Uh, I'll do brown. Oh, that's too dark. Okay, grayscale. And maybe I want to invert it or not. So there's my, my color palette, my side scan. I can do the same thing as before, where I can make this as a GeoTIFF and then start draping it. Zoom extent. Yeah, we really don't want to have the left right indigo, the male, the scaling bar. Um, Post processing, export. Geo image, save it as definitely as a 32 bit, all in UK. And this is too high. One. So, with our Bathy grid, which we had before, I'll do everybody. And take off my side scan. And I have my Bathy grid as my 3D view. Now let's clear everybody and start fresh. I'm going to dock it over there. So I'm going to take my grid. I'll take my average grid. And I'm going to make it into 3D. And I'm going to take my side scan, which is my geo image, add my geo image. Geo tip. They're not touching each other, so I have to drape them. So I go back up to the grid, and what do I want to drape? I want to drape the side scan on it. 
and there's my sites and I use different line areas. I use one line instead of all the lines. But that's where you know some of these, these you know tools that we have. Once we have the bathymetry, once we have the side scan, yeah. Before I show this, the sub bottom as well. We don't need that anymore. So we saw that the in the, the patch test, we saw a swath editor, area editor. We have tide and sound velocity, and if we bring in a tide file. We can import one or we can create one manually. Um, if we had a template, we can bring in different values or, or read it from an ASCII file. And, and same thing with the sound velocity. We can bring in a, a sound velocity profile, or if the system has a profile, we could use it. In the tide and sound velocity manager, this is oops, cancel. I got to turn them on. Tide and sound velocity manager, we say, well, what's my surface sound velocity? Do I have a sensor? Do I have a tide value? Am I using a ray trace or fixed value? I probably want to use sensor value. Um, so then I have a profile coming in. So the idea is that we have all these different values that we can apply to this data. So it's not just a point data and, and let's get out. It's, it's a fully populated process data set. I change something here, which I just enable something. I can just quickly merge it and finish it out. And whatever change I made for the sound velocity, we'll, we'll change it out there. Under the BAFTI exports, we saw that the XYZ in the grid, LAS is the typical LIDAR files and contours, export out the shaded release. A lot of the times we want to get the data out. Common file formats, if I want to create a, a, a GSF file or whatever the file for, uh, HSX, GSF, XTF, I don't know why I can't create those. I, I can export out the values. When we have this data in, in the files, it's, it's the CDF files. Well, I want to go to the tools for a second because we can manipulate XTF files and CSF files. This is a side scan file. If I want to make my side scan to an XTF or my sub bottom from CSF to seg Y, we're working in our CSF and CDF files, but we have ways of exporting out. The CSF is different than the CDF, so we have some of the tools for the CDF built in up there where we have the split and the export. Um, export raw BAFI values. There's two ways to always grab stuff, sound velocity, tide, and sound velocity manager. Okay, so there's just, just different ways of, of looking at the data. Um, well, let's go back to the data that we worked with before on the barges. So we're back to the 6205. And now we want to take our side scan. We had it from before where we had a nice image. Um, but if we brought in more than one side scan file, right click, import, and I'll bring them all in, one of them is going to say it's already there and it's going to override it. But notice that the barge is all shifted out. It's not exact. It's, it's a little bit hard to... Slice it over. That there's an offset there. And that's because we applied the offset to the bathy, but not the side scan. The side scan doesn't use the vessel editor. There's an X and Y offset. There was a minus 1.79 and a minus minus 1.58, an X and a Y. It's a fixed mount and it wasn't towed. So what I could do, and I'll make this bigger so we can see what we're doing is in the side scan itself, I'll turn them all on, but in the side scan itself, um, we don't want to have course made good, we want to have sensor heading, and we want to have zero, because we're using this actual value. And I can select all of them, oops, sorry. I can select all of them and do the, not in the course made good, but the sensor heading. And there's still no smoothing on sensor heading. So that gets us to, a, a correct heading sensor. Remember, this is a side scan based system. So even though we're bringing in a side scan, it thinks it's going to be towed. Well, we go down a little bit more. If there's pitch available, we can apply the pitch value if there's pitch in the data. Go down a little bit more. We have layback, which is a towed cable, and we have a sheave offset. And the sheave offset is your X and Y positional offsets. 
Here's your X and Y. Well, I'm going to enable this. Well, a little thing in, in, Ch in Chesapeake world is this is indented a little bit. It kind of means you have to turn layback on. Even though there's no layback, I still have to turn that on. We're going to fix that. But right now, if I want to use an XY offset, just enable the layback. It's kind of like that range filter. We had to turn on the global range filter and then go down to the, the, you know, the 75 degrees to 78 degrees. So my X that I was using was minus 1.79. And the Y that I was using was minus 1.58. So now the, the side scan data should look at least together a lot nicer. Well, let's let's go ahead and, and throw on um, some settings and, and build an EGN table. And I'll make everybody look like each other, make others like this. Dialog box is here, but you can't get to the OK button because it's the screen resolution. Check all, check all. OK. And, and there's my data. So we want to make sure that the side scan, a little swiper up there, you have these features. Side scan. These features all lined up, and it, it's pretty close. I kind of cheated a little bit on, on my offset, but it's much better than before. Thing about side scan is you don't need redundant data. Multi beam is great, um, and multi beam is absolute. It says X, Y, Z, and Z is the Z. With side scan, if there's any positional error, any other errors. But in fact, we can look at. We'll take a target out here. I'm trying to. Get a distinct, there's a target between the two. There's plenty of rocks out there, but let's just take this one target. In between the two, we're going to look at that target and see how much it shifted on, on all the lines. So in processing, capture contact, I want that one. And it brings up my dialog box. I'm going to grab that one target. I'm going to the next line. Okay, I'll go to the first line then. Dookie, Ooh, right there. Next line. Problem is the contacts are on top of each other. And they're showing up. That's fine. And the next line. <laughs> they're, they're almost exactly on top of each other. Let's, let's do our best to resolve it. So I created all these contacts on, on all four lines. And if I look at my contact, in themselves, there's my contact on one, next, contact two, contact three, contact four. And how close are the contacts? Well, assuming we, we measured them exactly correct, and I zoom in to the really, really tight. Let's take our side scan. We don't need our side scan anymore. And we don't need our grid. There's my contact. So I measured these contacts. But it's the same rock, and they're all moving across. It's not much. And again, I, I didn't do an exact job. But if I look at from end to end, 90 centimeters, and, and over here, 45 centimeters. So let's just assume that this is a, an issue with a positioning issue. How do I resolve this one rock is, is, is in a perfect position? We don't know which one's correct. So I could take the first contact to the last contact, I take them all. And I right click and I rationalize. I said, I don't know which one, but I'm going to rationalize that they're all the same. And it comes up with a final contact in the middle. Get rid of my arrow. And that's basically saying, we don't know exactly which position it is, but I'm going to take an average of all four of the positions. And in my target report, I come up with a final contact position. So when we have these contacts and we know it's the same rock, but we also know that the side scan system moved. You know, this is one way of adjusting stuff.
So there's there's my my data itself, um, and it's the same rock. So there are ways to to clean things up in that manner, where positioning is an important thing with side scan, really important with multi beam. But here's one way of, of cleaning it up. So I got off a little bit. So there was my I cleaned up my side scan the best I can. And I was started to say that you don't need all this data for, for to make a mosaic. So what folks do is, okay, they have a single line out there, and maybe they have another line out there, and now there's still a tremendous amount of overlap. Um, I mean, there's another line out there, and, well, we don't need this one, so we kind of went through there. What about this line out there? Oh, the last line out there. That's on top. So maybe I'll go right-click, and I'll use my display range. Instead of using 75 meters, I, I use 45 meters. You know, I really don't need all this data. And right click, display range, 45 meters on the same side. Huh. It's still a tremendous amount of overlap, but I want to make sure that in my processing under my order or sorry, view, Drawing mode, side scan, oops, overlap mode, cover up root mean square, and that cleans things up. When I'm comfortable, I'm going to go into processing, export, save as geo image, and I'll call it side scan. And we can make this a little bit tighter, 0 0.5, 32-bit. I want to see what it looks like, and we'll say OK. And there's my data. So it's a GeoTIFF image, and we have our grid. We don't need our side scan anymore. We have our grid data. And I'm going to make sure that I well, we want to use an interpolated grid. We want to clean things up. And I'm going to make sure my grid is turned on in this extra right there, 3D view. Last time, 3D enable. Dock it over here. There's my bathy. I'll bring in this little feature, a geo image. Add in the geo image, which is the. Be nice if we remember the right project. Barges, GeoTIFF, side scan. It's floating in midair. So I go back to the, I brought it in as a geo image. I go back to the grid. And I say, I want to drape it on that tip. And then we can close this dialog box. Make it look bigger. And I can exaggerate a little bit. So now when we think about our side scan, it's, this gives a little bit more perspective. So this is the 6205 data. It's co-located transducers. It's the exact same JSF file. We're bringing it in. And now rather than having a flat side scan of maybe it's a barge and I'm looking at shadows and some rocks, we give it a little bit of elevation. So it's a really nice way of, of showing off this data. Um, so I didn't want to, I don't like to just drag on for the sake of shift five. Um, so what I wanted to show was the bathy processing. The only thing I failed miserably was this beam performance test, which I can try to resurrect after the break. Um, but I wanted to go through at least the bathy processing of a multi-beam data set Bathy processing of the 6205, the ways to, you know, get rid of the flyers, get rid of the outliers, whether it's a line by line or all the lines, and different ways to, you know, view the data once it's done. Let, let's take a, a quick 15 minute break. Thank you. All right, well, let's 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 get started. I want to do some a few export functions. It's not really export functions. It's some more of the you know, the, the displays that we can handle. And I did a lot of the 3D draping, and I already showed the contact reports, the rationalized contract uh, contacts. Um, so I was trying to put them in, in between so we wouldn't all save them to the end. But I want to go one more project in the export functions, and then I, I, I'll finish up with this. Uh, I probably have nine or 10 slides in my presentation. Um, so, one of the things we have in, in Sonar is when we close down our, our, our map window and our 
properties window. And we can always get them back under the view, under processing views, we can see them back. But there is also a, a, a layout manager where by default, oh, cancel. By default, there's a, there is a layout, oh, it's on my other screen, um, that comes up with what it should be standard. You know, log information, left, right, um, properties tab. But I went ahead and I did layout for a side scan and bath. If I was doing data collection, I, I'd like to see different windows. And I'm going to load up this layout. And this is what my real-time layout would look like. And then I have another layout called survey just for side scan. A little bit different. Um, that's my bathy and there's my side scan. You can see a little preview of it. So by default, the system comes with a with a, a value or a default window. But anytime you come up with one, you can always go ahead and, and, and create a new one. So if you like a certain display, a certain thing. Um, the information box down there is my output. So when I bring in a file or do anything, all this information gets logged. And it, it's a it's a running history, but if you somehow close it and you lose it, where is it? You could always bring it back up with under the view, processing view, output log. We save this all this information in this log file. And then under tools, I've been going to project folder. There's this output log folder. And it, and it puts it out into this log file right there. Notice that where I'm putting this data, it's app data, roaming, Chesapeake technology, Sono, we're seven. So it might be difficult to find. That's why we put the little shortcuts up there. You know, when we first install SonarWiz, we don't see SonarWiz. We see SonarWiz projects down there. That's where I've been doing all my projects, my barges in UK and Portland, co-locate. But the program itself is in program files. And within program files, this is an old one, the Chesapeake technology is SonarWiz 7. And this is our, our program where it resides. So it's a little bit hidden. Um, there's no data in this one. The data is in its own directory. Um, and there's log files in that app roaming directory. So it's just be careful You know, if you're looking for files where they're located. Um, I've been going back and forth to project folder, which opens up the project where we are so you can easily get stuff. We saw that the Bathy holds the CDF files. Um, the, the CSF will hold the side scan and CSF side scan sub bottom files. GeoTIFF, the grids, those files. Once in a while, we put stuff in miscellaneous. We have XYZ if we're saving data to XYZ. What we don't see in here is the raw data. Well, this is my side scan data. This was the Sonar which barges, the, the 6205, those JSF files. The raw data doesn't go into the project. In fact, the raw data on my desktop has been residing in in this here the entire time. Oh, I have tied sound velocity as well. But the raw data doesn't get part of the project. If you want to bring it over, you're going to have to copy it over. So when you import a file, it doesn't automatically bring in the raw data file. Um, so we did the side scan rack, the Norbit, the 6205, the sub bottom. This this sub bottom. The, the last project I have is a 4125 side scan. Um, and after a while, we we tend to yeah you know, notice everything's the same. But it's this plus bar. We want to make a new project. And this is the 4125 data uh, UK. And it was actually collected in New Jersey. And I know this position is wrong. So we're going to have to find from file where it is again. Desktop. Training data, UK class, 214125. And they're actually really big files. And I only want to look at a little section of it. We're towing, it was a short tow, so I'll use some smoothing. And I'll, I'll create this folder. All I did was create a, a project. Right click, import a file, and I'm going to bring those two files in. We have the high and low frequency. Let's bring in the high frequency. Um, the JSF, again, if things work fine the first time, I'm not worried about it. 
So then you get this error message. Two files cannot be imported. I know exactly the reason, but why? Read the output message. Well, where is my output message? Well, I, I, I hit it. So under the view, under processing view, log message, there it is. And it says on the bottom, it should be written in red. Uh, Let's try it one more time. It should be that channel three and four. There it is. There's no high frequency in this data. So when red, you see anything in red in there, that means something's going on. Um, so none of the files got imported. Sometimes you can bring it in and brings in partially and it has the properties and it, it says there's a red light next to the bathymetry if we're doing bathymetry. But in this case, it says, there's an input error in channels three and four, contains only channels one and two. So these error logs are actually useful. A lot of the times I just hide it because it takes up too much of my real estate. Um, so I'm gonna import the files again, I'll bring in the two files, and all I have to do is bring in channels one and two, and it works fine. And I knew it was gonna work. But that's why I, I, I haven't been showing the log file because most of the time, as you see, it's green. and and it's not because I've been using demo data sets, it's, it's just because we haven't done anything to bring up a failure point. Down there is the only interesting part of this, this section that I wanna look at. It's a, it's a bridge piling. And that's it. But the file is huge and I'm gonna carry around all this, this information that I don't want. So I can clip the file if I wanted to, I could split the file Auto split, split with a mouse. Yep, and I'm gonna split it right over there. Yes. And it's going to make two files. It's it's actually building a new file. And that's the only one I want. And that's the other app. So now I'm gonna take this one and split it as well. Split with a mouse, eh, approximately over there. Close enough. Hopefully I got the bridge. Okay, there's my bridge. So I was going to process the data. It's the only part of this river survey that, that I'm interested in. So I don't need to you know, worry about everybody else. Right click, bottom track. There's no bottom track. You know, if I track it now, it finds the bottom pretty well. And there's a bridge we're worried about. And there's some fish, so maybe I have to increase the threshold a little bit. And sometimes you just can't get rid of the fish. But let's not worry about that right now. So I have all these files. I have this right click up on top where I can batch bottom track. Where I, same as before, the ordering is a little bit different. I have the, whatever values I used last time, track selected, I can track them all. Well, it's just track selected. And I do batch bottom track. Yeah, but you know, I always a little bit cautious. I always wanna make sure that I'm close. And if there's anything that's, that's left over, yeah, I, like I missed a fish. So I still might wanna go in there and remove it. But that batch bottom track does a really good job of getting rid of, well, getting the first iteration of the bottom. This is, yeah. we can track on port side or starboard side. This definitely looks like it's off the bottom, it, it's fish. I'm just going to window it out. And again, <laughs> there's nothing on this side, it's only one side. I'm I'm doing a pretty good liberty of, of, of yes, it's, it's not real, but I know it's not real. Fish really plays havoc with data. This was some kind of turn in there. I'm just gonna leave it. I'm not really worried about that. So I batch bottom track. I cleaned up the bottom track. I wanna just take, and I, I don't want these two files. So I'm gonna take those, this file and this file. If I right click, I can remove the files, which is okay. If I delete the files, I'm actually deleting the CSF files. I'm deleting it off the hard drive. So be really careful with delete. And it also deletes the associated information if you have it in context or anything. So I'm just gonna go ahead and delete them. 
just be careful with the delete. Right click, settings. Um, you know, quick and dirty, I always look at TVG just to see what it would look like. A um, little bit dark. I mean, that's the shoreline. But if I take off e and put on EGN and I build up those two, low frequency. All right, so that's the one we did. That's the one we didn't do. Right click. We notice that we'll choose a bounding box. We could see how much overlap we have. And if I go into my measurement tool, I can see I have about 15 meters of overlap. So maybe I want to remove five meters of the swath just you know because we have a lot of overlap. So I do my trim. Just display range rather than 75 meters, I'll just do 70 meters, which is pretty good. And then I go right click, make like others, just like what we've been doing before. Apply all settings. Okay. And there's my data. And from what we started before, we can actually see these, these bridge pilings a, a, a lot nicer. But how do we know they're bridge pilings? Well, um, one, I collected the data in a river, but how do we really know it, it, it's bridge piling? In the map view, I can export this to Google Earth, which is one of the images I showed, but I'm in SonarWiz. I can go to Map Manager. I'm going to add an online map, and I'm just going to go USA Topo Map. This is just these are the free ones. Some of them you have to pay for. I'm not paying for anyone. Um, and there's my topo map. So it, it's in what you zoom in. If I zoom out a little bit, you know, the extent stops. So it's it's the level that you zoom in on, and that's sitting up here in maps. We get all this done. Um, we make our geo image. We can export it out. We we already export it out to Google Earth. Once I made the TIFF file, I can do anything I want. You can't go into export a Google Earth without a TIFF file. So we have to make a TIFF file. But maybe I don't want to have this this color. Maybe I want to change my color. I really don't want this. I want to have gray. We're traditional school. And we're going to be this color. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm a fan of that, but um, so one of the things I just want to you know, reiterate is when we bring this data in uh, under the site scan itself, uh, somewhere in the bottom, you get used to it. Is this course made good? If I put in zero, we and just Yeah, we need some kind of computation. But what happens if I put in 100? 100 versus 300. I mean, which value do we use? There's 100. Well, sometimes we want to look for a straight line. And there's a bridge piling up there. And I put in 400. At what point, we don't want to over smooth the data. There's a lot of things we could do with the side scan data that we can, yeah, you know, we're trying to image enhance it, but we don't want to didn't destroy any of the data itself. It's like the bathymetry. We're filling in the holes from the grid. We really don't want to do that. In this case, we don't want to move targets. We want to make it the best we can. Um, so what's the right answer? I don't know. The answer is whatever looks good, whatever you think looks good. But I try to look for a straight line edge. And I say, well, this is nice and straight for the bridge piling. And I put in a uh, 100. And that I'm probably in the wrong line. There we go. And I bring in 100. Is that still straight? And a little bit of a curve there. And if I go the wrong way, if I go in 50, it, it even gets worse. So, so by default, it's 300. We see it three times. We see it 
once we're making a project, once on the import, and now we can do it up here. So I always tell folks, leave it until you get to actually visualize the data. Um, when we're collecting side scan, um, the theory that we had this morning was, it's a pulse in the water, we get a range and we get a return. There's a little bit else that goes on. And basically everything is based upon time. And time is based on distance, which is based also on sound velocity. So we could bring in the, the, the value that's in the file. Well, if we don't like it, we can change it. So we can say, well, it was 1500, but it really was 1520. We could do this on the import and we can do it now. So there's a couple of things in Sono is that you get two chances to do. Um, don't blindly just put it in unless you, you're sure about it. But if you took a sound velocity cast and it was 1530, you're working in warm water, put in 1530 because the difference is 2%. So that rock at 50 meters might be 51 meters. I mean, it, it, it'll probably adjust everyone else outside of that. So we can do our sound velocity adjustments as well. I have, um, I want to go back to the co-locate. This is my last feature set, and then then I'm going to be done. So imagine we had our, our side scan data. Co-locate. And, and the side scan data, we wanted to do some kind of ridding. We wanted to do some draping, but we didn't have the, the we don't have a bathy grid. What we have is is the side scan data. And, and from the side scan data, we know that right click on it, bottom track. We we know there's a bottom track. So on a fixed mount system, from the top to the bottom is the water depth. So we assume that, and if you're telling it, you need the pressure sensor, but we, we know that the altitude is the bottom depth. So in, in this in the tools, I mess up once in a while, grid and contour. I'm doing something with a tool inside Sonar with that may not have been designed to what I want to do, but I want to build a bathy surface with the side scan data and then be able to drape it because right now draping this tip would be flat. There would be nothing there. So grid and contour brings up this. I want to grab out the altitude. And if we were telling it, it would be the altitude plus sensor depth, but we're just doing altitude. Um, I'll make a DXF file. It doesn't mean anything. I'm going to put it into the shape file. And what this really is doing is making a, a shape file of, of the data. I only want to have um, these. I don't need the other ones. And it's going to go ahead and build in a file. And give it a second or two. And it's done. And being done, what I would talk about is if I go into my shape file, I have an X, Y, Z of this data. Okay, it's pretty crude. It's, it's just your native depth along track. It's separated by 100 meters. And your typical single beam survey when you think about it. Um, we don't need that, the, uh, the, the contour. But I'm going to take in this grid. I'm going to create a new grid. And I'm going to have it in an external. I'm going to create a grid from that XYZ file. And it's C. Project co-locate. And the reason they put it in shape file is because we weren't supposed to be doing it this way, but I am. I'm going to have grid cell size. I'll probably have to make it pretty big. I'll make it 10. And size scan data. How do nearest Natural neighbor, natural neighbor, I think is me. And it, it's building a, a grid based on natural neighbor, and it should come up with a surface. Take off my, and there's a, 
now there's a lot of interpolation going on. And if I didn't have all this, it would be fine. But there's my Abathy surface. Okay. And I'm going to display that in 3D. At the same time, I'm going to take my side scan data. Let me turn this off for a second. And as quick as I can, I'm going to just make a TIFF image. I didn't do any gain corrections or anything. I'm just going to do co-locate and I'll do two. 20, 32 bit has to be 32 bit. Huh. So in my 3D view, need my 3D view. It's a little baby one. There's my 3D view of a grid that I created from depth from the NATO. If I take in my, my geo tip, which is co-locate, geo tip, co-locate, I go back up to the grid. This is where I drape it. I can get some elevation to side scan where I never had a bathy grid before. Not the prettiest, and certainly it's only going to take that one point at the native, but it gives you something. So even if you didn't have a bathy grid, we can start doing some elevations and, and some kind of draping of the side scan data. So there's just another little tool that we have for it, that I found that if you go into tools and grid and contour, has nothing to do with anything else, but we can extract out the XYZ file. So those are some of the tools we have in some, as much as I could do in, in three, four hours, show off each of the modules and, and some of the items. There are certainly new features in, in SonarWare 7.7.3, the one we're on. Um, I've pointed out a few. It should be released by next week. It's going through testing this week. And except for that beam performance bug, um, I haven't really hasn't crashed on me. And I was taking a little bit of a chance this morning saying, yeah, I'd like to use it just to, to be able to you know show off a couple of new things. But um, shift F5, oh, this one. Huh. So I'm done with mine. I wanna go over some ideas that, that we have and Edge Tech is just gonna do a, you know, a thank you for attending presentation or, or whatever. But um, I, I started, this is what we had this morning using SciScan. Okay, so what's next? So this is into my crystal ball. This was a presentation I, I, I started last December, so about two months ago. I've improved it a little bit and, and changed a couple of words to make sure it's up to date. But um, we used 773, and we're the first ones to see it. And congratulations, we're, we're the first ones to see. You can tell everyone we've used it. Um, we're going to do minor updates every four weeks, which is pretty much on schedule. It, it's somebody has a bug and they want to get it fixed, we can get a patch out in, in a day. But we typically have a full install every four weeks, so it's not bits and pieces. So instead of a 32 megabyte SonarWiz EXE, it's a 500 megabyte install. And that's what we do for the minor updates. The major update is once, maybe twice a year, depending on what we're really doing. Um, typically, the, the major updates at the end of the year, we get, you know, September, October, we, we put a hold on, on development spend the next two months fixing everything we broke, and then come out in, in early December. Um, in this latest release, magnetometer and single beam, those were the push. We sometimes focus on a topic, in this case, two topics, to give it some improvements. There was nothing wrong with magnetometer, but it needed some you know, updates. In single beam, we're doing a lot more with the dual frequency. And the big thing with the single beam is we're grabbing the acoustic signal, acoustic data, and bringing that into our sub-bottom engine. I might have a slide on that later on. We did the EGN table, individual AWS updates. Um, there were some instances in certain machines that it didn't like. Um, we're working on Azure, that's gonna happen soon. Hummingbird SON files, geoacoustics, we have a direct driver. Um, Solstice um, updated that, the AMR updated that. So some of them we had drivers, some of them we actually had to make new drivers for. So language translation, we're trying to go into 12 languages and die and change all the dialogue boxes and even the logs. And it's, it's a, I got one guy working on it 
and it's a slow process. And, and, and my prediction is, let me go to my next slide, it's a Q2 release. And I wanted a soft rollout in March, but I'm just going to hold off until, you know, May or June before I release it out. But it's it's going to be nice. It's, you know, we we're so used to doing everything in English, but, you know, I can't force everyone to understand English all the time. Um, this directory monitoring, this is our auto processing where we find a file, it automatically processes the data. Um, it's a handoff operation. We do it for side scan. We're adding bathymetry and sub bottom. Um, that huge list that I showed earlier this morning was, it's growing too big. So I want to have a simplified import view where bringing a file is a side scan sub bottom because that co locate was XTF that had sub bottom and side scan. And we actually have to bring it in twice. I'd rather just bring it in once and have multiple selections when you bring it in. Um, we're adding Azure to the DFL licensing. It's not that SonoWiz doesn't work on, uh, on the cloud. It's just it's a licensing thing. We do notice that there's an instance or an instance. The, the read-write is, is limited on some of these cloud machines. So you can get the really high-end machine and, and you're still limited. So even though you're... You have a faster machine, you may only be two times faster from your desktop than 10 times faster. And it has nothing to do with, with the machine. It has to do with you know, the restrictions of the I.O., how we're writing it. So that leads us to rewriting our CSF file. Behind the scenes, no one's ever going to know about it, but it improves the overall performance. We'll look at some more forward-looking sonar. So that's a Q1 release. That's what I said we're going to do that. The rotation of it, you know, in December, I stood up and said, we're going to do it, and we did this already. We did this in January. Um, so rather than just being north up all the time, we could be line up. We can have any user defined. So if you're doing acquisition and you want to keep the boat north up, you can have the boat north up. You can have the boat heads up. Sorry. You can have the boat heads up, or you can always drive the line north up. The magnetometer, we spent the last four or five weeks on updates. Yeah, we didn't. Yeah, make any new relevations, but it we moved stuff around and it became more user friendly. We put this little value there as opposed to the the green global setting. We had to jump between the programs, would so jump out of here and make it setting. So we just made it easier. So we're done in seven seven three. Um, it, <clears throat> this in the last few weeks we worked on both the geoacoustics and pulsar where. Not only do we have a driver, but we have a driver that can plug directly into the sonar. So like Discover runs Edge Tech, and we listen in to Discover and have a logger for that. With this Geoacoustics, we can plug directly in so there's no other software. In, in fact, Geoacoustic is packaging all their systems that come included inclusive with SonarWiz. You don't have a choice. You have to get SonarWiz. Someone's going to be paying for it along the way, but that's that's our, you know, our new drivers. Um, the edit, that was one thing I didn't show, that we can edit navigation and sound velocity and heading in, in, in SonarWiz in this program called Z-Edit. It's a terrible name for the program. Um, you would think Z meaning depth edit, but it's any ancillary field that can be edited. Um, we added sound velocity because it's never been there, so it's a new field. But we also applied um, multiple files. If you made an edit or change or some kind of filter to smooth the navigation, you would apply to all the files. Um, we added a fixed time to XTF. We're going to use top messages for HSX, the laser, um, what's it called, um, LIDAR data, um, lat long and HSX, which is which is new for high pack files. So the search from location can now be done with an HSX file or is planning to be done. Segway, we can export, I'm sorry, we can read in the Segway version two. We're going to export to that version as well. And we're also going to log to version, Segway version 2. EdgeTech had asked us to do um, the Segway. Muhammad had asked me to do the Segway. So we can bring it in. It's just the next two things, export it out and directly log to it. So I'm going to consider that done. Not the bottom part, but at least the, the Z-Edit part. And what I was working on with single beam um, last week was this single beam performance test. Well, I didn't get the multi-beam performance test to working, but this is similar what it would look like. I'm in, in this case, I'm taking a single beam line and comparing it to the grid. And this is another check you do with single beam. You know, you could do a single beam line to line comparison and get a you know spot points of where did they overlap and what exactly were the values, or just do a global, show me what the difference is against a grid. 
you know, the grid is your reference surface, here's your single beam line. And so this will be part, this is included in the 773 right now. We could split the CDF, that was for a single beam, but it carried over to the multi-beam. This is a dual frequency single beam. I can make two, two single files. So I'm going to consider that done at 773. So what we're working on now and beyond is as the industry changes, we have to change at least as much as we can. You know, high resolution sonars, I always question the two centimeter mosaic because the files get huge, but somebody wanted them. And well, we had a hard limit of three centimeters, which didn't make sense. We just put three in there thinking nobody would want to go less than three. We removed it. So technically you could do a, a 0.5 centimeter resolution. You, your file will become huge, so just don't do it. Um, how do we plan for new systems? Well, everyone says, I want this, and we look at their requests. I'd like to say most of them, half of them get done at least. Um, how it fits into the program, will it break anything? Yeah, a little feature, move this button, that's easy. Reinvent the wheel that takes two years. That would be a tough one because we have a lot of other things going on. And being on an agile platform, we need something, I wouldn't say today, two weeks ago, we needed something in 773. It made it into 773. We didn't have a, we have a process, but we don't have a you know, management process to say, well, what's your revenue stream going to be in three years if you make this change? We don't do that. That was the old job. <clears throat> now we have a team discussion. Will it break the program? Will it make the program better? And that's our discretion. So keep you running <coughs> with the latest features so you can do your job more efficiently. So where to next? Well, <laughs> trade shows are limited or non-existent in 2021. Whether or not they actually happen, we'll see. I mean, we'd like to get out and, and show off our stuff and talk to people. So we're doing virtual trainings. We have yeah, three webinars or weekly webinars in March, um, side scan, game controls, magnetometer, and bathy editing, just something something unique. 45-minute webinars on a single topic. It, it could be interesting. I'm not going to do it. That's what I have my employees who do. They're going to be doing it for me. Um, we're doing a three-day training class in June, similar to our December class. It's a full end-to-end -end class, hands-on, um, being virtual, you know, like I said earlier, we get a lot more people showing up. We were typically, we'd have 70, 80 people in our December workshop. We had 250 people show up or virtually attend in, in December. So in, in June, I know it's part of a survey season, but you know we, we have schedule laid out that if you want to just do side scan or just do bathymetry, it's separated by days, so we can do it that way. Um, I implemented quarterly newsletters to keep everyone up to date. Um, it's due on the 15th of the month of the quarter, and on the 14th of the month, everyone is still writing their article. Even though everyone had three months notice to write an article, they're writing it on the last day. But it's important to show what the programmers are doing and show what support's doing, coming up with some creative solution in, in, in terms of you know, what is helping one person might help someone else. And then once the show, once we can start meeting in person, We'll get back to our in-person class, in-person trade shows, and, and everything else. But for now, we talk to each other on go-to meeting and, and, and webinars. So I, I, I'm going to close with mine, and I'm going to pass it off in a few seconds. If you have any reach questions, send me an email and give me a call. I'm on East Coast time. So I started this morning at 5 a.m. Um, that's fine. Yeah, it's when I have to do the stuff in Singapore that's 12 hours apart. This is only five hours. So with that, I appreciate everyone um, attending. I'm going to pass it to someone else. Um, I'll just, yeah, if you want me to tidy up, I'll tidy up with a few things on what Edge Tech's doing in 2021, and then I'll um, sure. uh, Neil. Okay, um, really just a, it's gonna be a little bit of a summary of some of the things that Richard and I have already said. Um, a lot of it is we're working on new frequency sets or even products that bring in new frequency sets so that the 6205s as richard said last year we added a couple of um, new frequency sets to um and really been adapting that product and the 2205s for some of the usv applications and frequency sets people want for that and even combining that with sub bottom again richard went for a lot of that earlier so we're continuing the work we're doing on that um, as I mentioned earlier, we're doing the uh, 540 and 850 kilohertz version of the 4205. That's due to be released shortly um, and go out to the first couple of customers. 
And we're going to add, with the 3400, we're going to add a version of the old 512 towfish um, with updated electronics and receive that will run with the 3400. And we've also built for a customer a, a, a pole mount version that had a, a large pole mount version that had one to 10 kilohertz transducers. So again, we're looking at some other options for smaller, lighter, different versions of um, the 3400 sonar head and that's really again just sort of expanding the the frequency range options and the capabilities of the system so those are all the things where we're taking current projects and expanding the range uh, within those product lines and as i mentioned earlier the, the probably the big new product is is the 2050 dss which will be the combined side scan and uh, and sub bottom profiler so really that's most of our focus probably for the first half and into the second half of this year um, from a hardware point of view and um, you'll hopefully start to see some of those get announced in um, social media and, and, and on our website so just keep an eye out and you should see the, the new products being uh, being launched as Harold said it's very difficult we would normally be uh, launching new products at trade shows now we do it virtually uh, as best we can so, um, and just really up with a, a thank you and a, and a thank you to um, Harold and to the team at Celerate for uh, hosting this and organizing it and very kindly inviting uh, EdgeTech to uh, participate. So now I'm gonna try and see if we can hand off to Neil to, to finish up. Okay, right, let me just drop back one. So, um, well, thank you everyone for sticking with us. It's been a long day and there's been so much information from um, Harold, Nick and Richard. I hope you've all benefited from that. So who are we? Well, my name's Neil Carter Davies and we are from Saderet Limited and we're the, the reps for Chesapeake and EdgeTech in the UK. And we are based in the Isle of Man. And the company started in 1998. And for those who are not that familiar with where the Isle of Man is, um, we do tend to get confused with the Isle of Wight, which is on the south coast next to Portsmouth. But the Isle of Man is in the Irish Sea. It's between... England, Scotland, Ireland and Wales and if you look on the map you can see that's where we're situated and the Isle of Man itself it's famous for the TT motorcycle racing which for anyone who's a petrol head they would probably know about this it's a road circuit around the Isle of Man it's in total 37.7 miles which works out to be just over 60 kilometers. And they average a speed of the current record is 135.452 miles an hour, which is just under 218 kilometers, which when you're standing about two meters away from somebody going past at 200 miles an hour is phenomenal. There's no way of describing it. And uh, these guys go around the Isle of Man circuit in 16 minutes. Bearing in mind, it's just a public road. As you can see in the picture, it it just beggars belief. Otherwise, um, moving on. So we're based in Douglas, and this is our picture of our office. We have workshop facilities, um, the test, the training. Uh, we have stores for a lot of the equipment that we hold. And we have a very environmentally friendly building. And as you can see, uh, we also have a number of um, uh, electric vehicles as well with our staff. So yeah, we're, we're very environmental. So who do we represent? EdgeTech and Chesapeake, which you very kindly listened to today. Um, we've had um, a lot of working relationship with these guys 
and they do a phenomenal job. We are the European distributors for Hemisphere GNSS, so they will, um, and we have around about 45 agents and distributors throughout Europe which are helping us with promoting the Hemisphere products. These are GPS products that for position and position heading devices. And these can be used on any number of uh, vehicles, boats, and so forth. We can uh, work from standard L1 GPS through to full RTK. Um, we have our own Hemisphere Alban correction service, so we can provide worldwide RTK corrections. So we cover the full um, spectrum of positioning and equipment. And these are supplied as a finished product and also OEM. So if you had a product or a design that you wanted to incorporate uh, GPS OEM boarding, please get in contact. We also represent Teledyne Marine for ADCPs. Uh, these are both uh, for river and sea applications, and these can be deployed on vessels, mid water or seabed um, applications. We also do horizontal ADCPs, more for like river discharge and so forth. So again, uh, a, a variety of products there. Coupled with that, we deal with deep water buoyancy and they offer bottom mounts and flotation uh, for ADCPs, uh, acoustic releases, pop-ups and so forth. And we also represent QPS for survey software. And I know that um, QPS have been working with Chesapeake on some of their import functionality for data sets. SATEL, uh, we do radio telemetry, which is a useful add-on to the RTK GPS equipment. This is UHF, VHF telemetry, which and all of the, the hardware associated with that. And we also represent um, Echo Logger, which is a, a compact echo sounder solution uh, as well. So. I apologize, it was a very quick run through, but I guess all you guys are probably uh, quite tired after having a pretty full on day today. Just to show you very quickly um, where our sales are going, predominantly it's the UK, but as you can see with the other countries, we have quite a, a large uh, customer client base throughout Europe and further afield. So, you know, it's, um, we do try to offer as many products as possible. Uh, typical clients that we have, they vary considerably. Uh, we have NOC in Southampton for doing the oceanographic type work. Same with British Antarctic Survey. We have you know, the Irish Marine Institute for the work they do. And then, um, for instance, Kinetic, the RNLI, uh, our equipment goes on. The, all the lifeboats and all the new builds and any number of uh, equipment rental companies and survey companies, uh, single operators and so forth. And as, as mentioned earlier, we have 45 dealers across Europe who are representing Hemisphere under our guidance. So thank you for attending today. Um, if you have any questions or if you have any further information or require any further information please do not hesitate to contact that's my email address but obviously you would have probably been dealing with harold or nick or richard um, if there's anything that you need to know please let us know and and thank you for your time today and likewise thank you to harold and nick and richard who've done a, a sterling job and I hope you've all learned something today. So take care, everyone, and hope to see you soon.